Newton we're getting. They've broken in Nelson Cohn, uh, Rosendale, Oxford, Rochester, Chatham, and Southampton Test. On the other hand, the Conservatives are holding Upminster, which means they're not being driven right out of this narrow range uh, of uh, marginals here. Uh, ah, we've just heard that Labour's picked up its switch, and therefore they're again within the 1% swing. They're picking up its switch now, we're told. And so that's the battle. The real battle's being fought there, with the, no, in no sense at all are the Conservatives being driven off the field, as some of the earlier polls seem to suggest. And they've held Hampstead, of course, uh, as well, which was one of the ones they could have lost if Labour was getting any really large swing. That's the position, then, in the battleground at the moment. Um, Eddie Griffiths, who was the Labour member for Brightside, who uh, failed uh, to hold the uh, loyalty of his own party there, has been beaten in Brightside. The Labour loyalist has held that seat for Labour. And, of course, Mr. Ross? Ernold Murray, yes, uh, Mr. Ernold Murray, who was the Conservative at Ipswich, he was the man with whom uh, Mr. Eddie Griffiths actually spent that rather damaging weekend talking about football. Yes, David, you were saying we had the result from Kilmarnock well, and Willie Scottish Ross... Well, the first Scottish result. It is always the first Scottish result. It's come in. We look for the figures because they will be the first solid evidence of what is happening to the SNP vote, which may hold the key to the whole election result. And, of course, a very important man there, uh, Willie Ross, the Secretary of State for Scotland, the great Pooh Bar and the Basso Profundo, I think Mr. Wilson has called him of Scotland in the cabinet and Mr. Ross has not taken altogether kindly to some of the ideas for exaggerated devolution in Scotland. Well, he'll have a say, no doubt, uh, if and when the Labour government comes to discuss this. Look at Mr. Heath waiting for his result at Sidcup. There he is, talking quietly there. Obviously, he's not going to be too disturbed about his own result there, but it must be disappointing for him that the Conservatives are losing this steady trickle of seats, which uh, must now, I think, give Labour still the opportunity of forming an overall government and must also perhaps put Mr Heath's own political future in some doubt. Now, the full result from Southampton test, this was a Labour gain, and this is Mr. James Hill. He'd been, uh, uh, he'd been, Labour have taken Peterborough from Harmer Nichols, we're told. That's another Labour result. We normally have a series of recounts there on a Friday. If we could go back to Southampton test, this is quite an interesting result. Uh, Gould is a New Zealander and a Rhodes Scholar, and he runs a social security advice centre there in Southampton. It's not for Don, actually. Classic's Don, I think. But uh, now that swing was a low, lowish swing, 1.6%. Again, lower swings uh, in the marginals. One point I think we should tell to our Welsh listeners, because we've, most, of the Labour seats in, most of the seats in Wales are absolutely safe and we don't give the details, but in fact, Plaid Cymru has been dropping in every seat we've heard from. Let's go to Sidcup for the Heath result. Mr Heath, standing at Sidcup, waiting for the result, he got up here to a cry of hello sailor from the crowd of the, from the body of the hall and, and gave a great grin and uh, I must say has been looking fairly cheerful. He's got his entire entourage here tonight. Mrs Morrison, who was uh, with him on the campaign, who bought the shirts, and uh, Tim Kitson and William Walgrave and Maurice Trowbridge, his press secretary. Expect the result in a moment. Mr Heath has spent the day here going around and he's uh, campaigned a bit here despite his national speech making tours which were very heavy burden to him during this campaign. Actually the returning officer is the Conservative Mayor is actually the... I hereby give notice that the total number of votes... Are we all, is that all right now? John Minnett. <laughs> John Minnett, the start. Tory Mayor of Bexley constituency. I hereby give notice that the total number of votes given for each candidate at the parliamentary election in the Bexley Sidcup constituency was as follows. Heath Edward Richard George, Conservative, 18,991. Jennings William John, Labour, 11,448. Jones, Douglas Hartley, Independent Conservative, 174. Josephs, Ian Richard Phillip, Liberal, 6,954. <laughs> Norton, Marcus John, Lady Prime Minister, 61. Party. And that uh, Edward Richard George Heath has been duly elected to serve as member for the said constituency.
Mr. Mayor, may I thank you on behalf of all the candidates in this election and the acting returning officer and his staff uh, for the way in which they have conducted the business of the election. Having visited all the polling booths today, I have been able to see the admirable way in which the arrangements worked. And I would like to thank them very sincerely uh, for the way in which they have carried out uh, their duties. And to thank, too, the police who were present at the polling booths and who have looked after the arrangements for the electors. Could I also take this opportunity of thanking all those who have supported me in this campaign, my own workers, and particularly those who have been looking after the conduct of the campaign in my absence for so much of the time in the rest of the country. Uh, to them, I owe a particular debt, and tonight I would like to place it on record. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, the executive officer here tonight, the town clerk, all their staffs, for all they have done to carry out the arrangements so effectively and so agreeably. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Returning Officer, I would like, like to thank uh, the Returning Officer. And the end of another count for Mr. Edward Heath. Last time that he was there, he of course had to return in some gloom to Number 10 Downing Street knowing that his effort then to form a government which could uh, solve the economic problems of the country in the way he wanted had failed. And now this time he is finding that the Conservatives have again lost seats and he is not going to form the next government on the present showing. Let's go to Bath now for the result in Christopher Mayhew's seat. As returning officer for the Bath constituency, I hereby declare that the total number of votes given for each candidate at this election was as follows. Malcolm Leslie Bishop, Labour, 14,011. Yeah. Edward Joseph Brown, Conservative, 18,470. John Vernon Kemp, United Democratic Party, 150. Christopher Pageant Mayhew, Liberal, 16,348. And that Edward Joseph Brown has been duly elected to serve as member for the Bath constituency. Sir Edward Brown, who is a Conservative trade unionist and, of course, a long-time member, and he has held the seat against the challenge of Christopher Mayhew, so we should call it Brown's seat, not Mayhew's seat, in future. Mr Mayhew, of course, caused something of a sensation when he resigned from the Labour Party in July, saying that he was moving too much towards the left wing. One wonders now what he thinks of the national result as well as of his own. Well, that's a the tide, he pushed the vote up by 3% for the Liberals in... But it's still a disappointment oh, for the Liberals. Much, There's better news for the Liberals in that Cyril Smith has been returned at Rochdale. One or two small points for the Conservatives, some seats which might have gone had the swing been very serious against them. They've held Cardiff North West. They've held South End West, that's Paul Channon's seat. If the Liberals were to have done well tonight, that was one that might have gone. And, of course, we've seen Linda Chalker holding on in Wallasey. Now, Robin Day is talking down the line to Birmingham to Roy Jenkins. Good, good morning, Mr Jenkins. Good morning. I don't know whether you've uh, followed it, but Labour have gained Lincoln, Oxford, Nelson and Cone, Rochester, Chatham, Southampton, Test and Ipswich, and Mr Mayhew has just lost in Bath. What's your reading of things now with the prospect, as far as we can see, of a small Labour working majority, but we're not quite sure? My reading is that um, the prospect looked exactly as you said, that we'll have an effective working majority, which will be a substantial change from the last Parliament. In other words, we can look forward to a parliament running its full length with formidable tasks ahead for the Labour government, but with a majority on which we can undertake these tasks in a sense of responsibility. Do you think that the defeat of Mr Tavern and the failure of Mr Mayhew is uh, a blow to their hopes of getting a social democratic realignment of the left outside of the Labour Party has been dashed? Well, clearly, the, their defeats are a disappointment to themselves. What I think it indicates is that it is um, better to fight for values which I hold dear within the Labour Party than outside the Labour are Party. Are you glad they've been defeated? 
I'm very glad that I have stayed within the Labour Party and won the best majority I've ever held in states for. Are I you never glad that Mr it. Tavern and Mr Mayhew have not won? Look, I don't comment about individual results. I have throughout this election supported a clear Labour majority and the Labour candidates and we look like winning a good majority and um, here in Stagefoot, we've won the best majority I think we've ever had. Would you stay with us for a moment, Mr Jenkins, because I'm now going to talk, talk to Mr Robert Carr. Uh, Mr Carr? Yes, I'm here, Robin. What do you think of how things are going? Do you think that the result shows that the Conservatives have done well to keep a Labour majority looking quite low, or if they'd fought a better campaign, they could have won? Well, it's certainly far too early to form any final opinion. One thing is quite clear, that the position for us is far better than the public opinion polls generally were forecasting. And I suspect by the time everything's counted tomorrow, it may yet get closer than, even than, it, than it seems at the moment. So I'm only rather reserving my opinion, as you might expect, until later. I remember what happened in 64 and how things closed very much in the latter stages of that count. It, it, if, if we can deduce anything from uh, the results so far, it looks as if the Liberal attempt to smash the two-party system is not uh, going to succeed. It's a vote f against minority government, if it's anything, isn't it? This yes, well, 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 certainly the Liberal vote has collapsed substantially, as indeed it has in my, my own constituency here. And it's quite obvious that, that a number of people, quite a large number of people in my constituency and others, voted Liberal last time, perhaps with the hope of denting the Tory majority, have now returned to the, Lib to the Labour fold. If the, Lib if the Labour working majority, if there is a Labour working majority and it's a small one, will you as a Conservative and other Conservatives argue that this shows that they should not follow m some of their more left-wing policies? Well, most certainly, because there's one thing I would imagine will be shown quite clearly by the time all the votes are counted and all the seats are settled tomorrow. And that is there will still be, in terms of popular vote, a very large majority of the people of this country against extreme socialist measures such as widespread nationalisation. What do you say to that, Mr Jenkins, if you were listening? Um, no, I wasn't listening very carefully, as a matter of fact. I, um, could you put the question to me again, Mr Day? Uh, well, it wasn't a question. I was wondering whether you heard what Mr Carr thought, that if the Labour majority was a small one, working majority, that the, this was a, a case which certainly the Conservatives would put for not proceeding with some of your more left-wing measures which might not be appropriate in this situation? I've always thought that whether the Labour Party had a big majority or a small majority, the Labour Party should proceed decisively with the measures which the Labour Cabinet regards as being in the interest of the country in very difficult circumstances. I don't think this means compromising weak measures. I think it means firm measures in the interest of the nation as a whole. Well, this uh, presumably means then that Parliament should be left completely free, for example, to settle the common market issue if the popular vote doesn't count. Well, uh, gentlemen, we may hear from you later. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Carr and Mr. Jenkins. Goodbye. Alistair. And while that conversation was going on, Labour have taken Bolton West. That's a success for Mrs. Ann Taylor. That'll be another Labour MP and a Conservative marginal tipping over. A little look now at Mr. Jeremy Thorpe's seat in Devon North. This is the full result of Mr. Thorpe. A very high turnout. And Labour, which lost its deposit last time, have jumped up. All the fall in Mr. Thorpe's vote almost is due to the Labour increase. And the independent there, Dr Hansford Miller, is of course an English nationalist. I wonder, David, we might have a word about the Scottish nationalists. We have some news from Kilmarnock. Well, on the first figures we've seen from Kilmarnock, we haven't yet got the full figures, the SNP increased their vote by just 15% in Kilmarnock. They came second with 30.2% of the vote. Now, that is very important because so far, of the 18 seats that Labour needs to win to get a clear majority, they've won 10 and only failed in one that we've heard from. And so they're heading the right direction for a clear majority, but Scotland could take it away. We've got our first indication from Scotland. And, of course, Hornsey, they're recounting at Hornsey. That's a marginal Conservative seat in North London. Here's our prediction at the moment of the result of this election. We still predict a clear Labour majority. And uh, the news there about uh, Hornsey, that's Mr. Hugh Rossi's seat, and that's one that uh, Labour have had within their sights. But with the Conservatives holding Gillingham, uh, it certainly is beginning to warm up around England. And here's the result from Ilford North. This is Mrs. Millie Miller taking the seat from Tom Armunger, who had been the Conservative member there since 1954. On a, very, on a low swing. 
Yes, he certainly fought in going down. And look at the Labour gains now so far tonight. First of all, Lincoln for Mr Dick Taverne, Nelson and Cohn, Rossendale, Oxford, Rochester and Chatham, Southampton Test, Ipswich, Bolton West, Ilford North and Peterborough, where we normally get all the recounts of the general election. These have gone to Labour and uh, Norwich South Labour uh, taking there. Here are some southeast results. Mr. William Hamling, Woolwich West, George Strauss at Vauxhall, and Mr. Guy Barnett in Greenwich, all safely back. And Dagenham, Sir John Parker, veteran member, Hornchurch, and Harrow East, Hugh Dykes, a Conservative who could have been in trouble had there been a bigger swing to Labour. Lower swings further out than the central swings we saw in the previous three. And uh, now for some comment and details about the South here, Sue. Well, the turnout does seem to be down in London, the South East, as opposed to the rest of the country. It's about 8% down at the moment, although there is a slight swing to Labour. Again, it's slightly below the national average. Let's take a look at the totals we've got in so far. Labour 19 in the GLC area, Conservative 15. And in the home counties, we've got Labour 8 seats. That's two gains for them. And Conservative 17 seats and two losses for them. But that's not really anything that can as so far be reflected on our GLC battleground here. For a start, the Conservatives have retained Romford. Geoffrey Finsberg is back in Hampstead. He's the MP, you might like to know, who has a car registration, which apparently was the size of his majority when he originally got in in 1970, RTO 474. He's increased that majority to four figures now, so he'll be pleased about that. But Conservatives have retained Upminster. John Loveridge is back in Upminster, although with a reduced majority. At the same time, as you've just heard, Labour have gained Ilford North, but we can't really move our pointer in any way yet because Labour have retained Putney and Paddington, Woolwich West and Battersea South, again as you've heard. So really our pointer is still stuck here. Brentford and Isleworth, Barney Hayhoe hanging on there with a 700 majority last time. That should be the next interesting one to come in on this board. As far as the Liberals are concerned, as you probably heard, their hopes Sutton and Cheam, they didn't make it. Graham Tope failed to regain the seat that he won in 1972 by election so dramatically and Neil McFarlane is back in Sutton and Cheam. But if the marginals aren't reflected on our GLC board, they are reflected over here on the Home Counties board because Labour have taken Oxford, Monty Woodhouse is out there, Evan Luard is in, Rochester and Chatham, Peggy Fenner is out and Robert Bean is in. So in a way we can start to move this pointer over here. Hemel Hempstead certainly looks in danger. And now let's take a look at some of the MPs, the well-known faces who should be safely back in the house. Among the Labour MPs safely back, Douglas Jay in Battersea North, an opponent not just of the common market but of London motorway boxes. Joan Lester, of course, safely back in Eton and Slough. Hugh Jenkins, Minister of the Arts in the last Labour government, is back safely in the marginal seat of Putney. For the Conservatives, Sir Geoffrey Howe, spokesman on social services, is back in Surrey East. And of course, Neil McFarlane, who increased his majority in Sutton and Cheam. And of course, not forgetting Mr Heath, who's safely back in Bexley Sidcup. Alistair. And so the South East is playing its part in the way in which the seats are going to Labour. Still sufficiently, perhaps, David, to give them an overall majority? I think there's sufficient. One thing that is notable about this result is really worth sp stressing, the uniformity of behaviour in this country. We haven't had a single swing to the Conservatives recorded with over 200 results in. We haven't had the highest swing to the Labour Party is 6%. We've actually had most of the... After that, the highest swing is 4.9. So almost every result we've had has been between 0.1 swing to Labour and 4.9 swing to Labour. It's an extremely uniform picture. And uh, Michael Foote is back at uh, Ebervale. That's the seat he took over from the late Nye Bevan. And there's the Secretary of State for Employment return to the new Labour government. Here is the situation, the state of the parties, Labour 137 seats with 10 gains, Conservatives 78 seats with 9 losses, and others, that's Dick Tavern, 1 loss. And talking now to Mr Heath at Sidcup is David Dimbleby. Mr Heath, what is your reaction to the way that the election results are going at the moment? I think it's much too early to come to any sort of conclusions at the moment. 
have you um, given up hope of a Conservative majority government at this stage? Well, um, I don't think I can really judge. I've heard some of the analysis which has been going on on uh, television. I'm not really at this moment in a position to judge about the eventual outcome of this. What was your reaction when you heard at the very beginning that uh, the, the, the polls were predicting a hundred Labour majority? Well, I didn't believe that any more than I've uh, believed the polls which have been going on the whole time. What's your reaction to the apparent difference in swing that we're seeing between North and South at the moment? Why do you think that is? Uh, well, again, I watched some of the results coming through at the beginning, but since I've been here at the count, I haven't had a chance of uh, hearing the latest results. It seems that uh, as far as the safe Conservative seats are concerned, there's been a swing towards us, which is in some cases quite substantial. Um, in the North, in safe Labour seats, there's been a substantial swing towards them. Uh, in the um, critical seats, I think the, the movement has been very slight indeed. But does that consolidation, in a way, of, of some of those traditional votes mean that your proposals for a, a government of national unity really have found no response in the other parties? I don't think so, necessarily, no. Do you think that the, um, the shadow of February has been across this campaign all the way through? Oh, I think it's been quite natural that with uh, two general elections in seven months, the people should obviously have had them both in mind. I don't doubt that for a moment. So that the events of February may have influenced people against voting Tory in this election? Well, on the other hand, uh, they may have uh, influenced people in supporting us. Here, for the first time, I've got a majority over all the other candidates. I didn't have that in February. You had here also, though, a drop in the Liberal vote. I wonder what your reaction is to the, to the overall drop in, in, in the Liberal poll. Again, it's impossible to judge this at the moment. Uh, we've had a lot of votes in the South in which the Liberal poll, as I understand it, has, fall, has fallen. I, I don't know yet whether there have been any results for seats which are Liberal held, or which were Liberal held in the last Parliament. So really, it's as much too early to judge the whole of this. I think one's got to wait for many more results before one can can see the outcome in me. Indeed, one may have to wait until they're all in. Would you be pleased if the, if the outcome seemed to reinforce the two-party system at the expense of the Liberals? Well, I, I, I don't think it's so much a question of being interested in the two-party system. I think that what matters at this moment is having support for the policies which are required uh, to deal with the crisis which the country faces. Uh, all the time that uh, we're watching results come through, there seems to be a rather heady atmosphere. Uh, as to what the swing is here or what the swing is there, uh, gains and losses and so on. That's quite understandable. Uh, but tomorrow afternoon, we've got to get down to the business of dealing with the problems of this country. Do you regard, Mr Heath, your own political career as at stake tonight? No. You don't think that uh, if you lose again this time, as I think Lord Boothby said, you may have heard him at the very beginning yes, of this programme. Really, uh, does one take any notice of people who've been out of politics for so long and are now in the House of Lords? And I mean, I don't think they really understand what's going on in this country at the moment it's uh, not and, and what people are concerned with. They discuss the campaign as if it was olden times in which you went about bashing everybody as much as you like. This isn't what the electors want, and I'm quite convinced of this, having been all over the country. What they want is a dialogue so that they can understand the problems and put their views back to the political leaders and as far as I'm concerned, that's the, the opportunity they've had in this election campaign. It's not true, as the old adage went, that the Conservative Party doesn't tolerate failure. Oh, um, I really don't think that's got anything whatever to do with it. I mean, You said yesterday, Mr Heath, that a, a Labour government could be fatal for this country. Do you still stand by that view? Yes, I do. A majority Labour government. A majority Labour government, which was given the necessary majority to carry through its policies in its manifesto, would be fatal to this country. Do you think that the signs of a majority Labour government, at least, um, are the, the signs that that's less likely as a result of what's come through so far? I've, already, still I've, already, I've already said that I'm not in a position to judge, and I don't think anybody else is at the moment. Um, what's your reaction to the uh, candidate who stood here, Mr Heath, uh, for woman Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher? Do you well, think that's a, a prophetic <laughs> candidate standing? <laughs> Well, he got, uh, what was it, 61 votes. I don't think women up and down the country ought to be discouraged by, by that into thinking that there's never, ever going to be a woman prime minister. I don't think that's the case. Still less Mrs Thatcher. Well, in fact, he did confuse the issue slightly as far as our own ballot is concerned because uh, he also put conservative after at the bottom of his uh, statement. And I understand there are about 150 spoiled ballot papers for people who put two crosses on in order to vote for both Conservatives. But that's by the way. I don't want the women to be discouraged by this. Can I just lastly ask you how you feel at this moment, Mr Heath? 
I feel like going to my headquarters and celebrating with all my party workers who've done a magnificent job. I spent practically the whole campaign going around the country. I was only able to come here uh, for, I think, four meetings. I had no opportunity of canvassing or doing anything else. And so I owe them a particular word of thanks, and I shall go now and give it to them. And do you still hope to be celebrating at Smith Square tomorrow? In Smith Square? Oh, that's the party headquarters. I shan't be going there tonight. And we'll wait and see what the results are tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. Heath. Mr. Heath, very relaxed and uh, smiling, and uh, indeed, quite rightly, refusing to discuss his own political future. I think it is important for Mr. Heath now whether or not Labour does get a clear overall majority or not, because if Mr. Wilson were to fail to break out, and our prediction is still that he will break out and get an overall majority, if he were to fail, then of course many people would consider that Mr. Heath had fought rather a good defensive campaign in this election, because Mr. Wilson might then be thought by some to be hamstrung. And so it really is going to depend, to my mind, David, on some very vital seats. I think it is. One notable thing, you may have seen the flash just now, that the, Labour, the applied Cymru had hold, held on to Marianis. Well, there are three seats which make a difference, where the Plaid Cymru have a chance. They're a key part of it, but Scotland's more important, and there we'll wait for the figures. Well, Conservatives have held on to Orpington, and that's one, of course, that the Liberals had hopes of, but with Sutton and Cheam out of the way, it does look a bad night for the Liberals. Uh, while we were talking to Mr Heath, you'd see the result from Bristol North West, a Labour gain there, removing Martin McLaren, who's hung on there. Well, he went out in 66, he came back in 70, he's gone now the second time in 74. Well, we've discussed some vital seats, and uh, I think this is an opportunity for Bob McKenzie to go over them with us on the battleground itself. Yep. Well, the battleground is working out extraordinarily interesting if you look at it, because the Labour Party is holding all its super marginals, the one most at risk. All the reports we've had indicate that Labour is consolidating its whole position. At the same time, it is cutting in to Conservative territory, but on a fairly narrow front so far, and roughly what you'd expect from the kind of national swing we're getting of around 2%. That is, they're cutting into places like these. We haven't heard from others. And here... But this uniformity is astonishing because no, in no case have they been able to jump over the swing into the other places where the Tories are holding their position Bob, quite I, effectively. Can I interrupt you one mm. moment? There is a Conservative gain at Hazel Grove, I understand. Ah. That's from Liberals. That looks like Dr. Win Stanley out. Sorry to interrupt oh, yes, you. Yes, fine. Okay. Uh, and so what the, the, the strong impression one has is of a very slight uniform swing that will probably give the uh, Labour government a renewed mandate with a majority. But we still don't know till we hear from especially Scotland. At the moment we do know, however, the Liberals have not reached takeoff point. They'll be lucky to be holding the 10 seats they used to hold before they got up to 14 in the last election. They've not taken off the way they might have had they gone up above 20% of the vote. And then, of course, we are only beginning to hear from Scotland, and we don't know yet whether they get to a takeoff position. They're getting up around 30% of the vote in some cases, but that only gives them perhaps 10 seats in Scotland, the SNP. And they haven't got yet got near the sort of breakthrough they need to begin to really cut into Conservative or Labour strength. And we know the Conservatives have held two seats in Scotland, so there's not much evidence yet to suggest the SNP is in takeoff position. But we won't know really, I think, Alistair, until we hear from Scotland whether Labour is absolutely sure of its overall majority. Well, that is uh, what the night will show, as sometimes uh, Scotland's a little slow in counting, but uh, slow and be sure. That's what we want to know from Scotland now. I mentioned there uh, this uh, liberal loss of Hazel Grove. We should perhaps try to balance that by telling liberals, uh, confirming that they have held the Isle of Wight, their most remarkable gain of the last and election. And also, they have held Devon North with Jeremy Thorpe and Rochdale with Cyril Smith. Mr Heath just now said he didn't know if the Liberals had held any seat. They actually have held three of the four seats in which they held before they have come in. Here's the Hazel Grove result. A uh, recount of Luton East, that is very interesting. because Labour held Labor. seat. And here is the Hazel Grove result. And uh, Michael Wynne Stanley, who appears uh, now and again in the House of Commons, this is one of his off elections. And so he disappears, no doubt, only temporarily. He'll be Labor took against most someone. of his vote away. Uh, took tw two thirds went to Labour, one third to the Conservatives. And here's the Bristol North West gain. Ron Thomas taking the seat from Martin McLaren. A small swing there. But the Conservatives now only have one seat left in Bristol. And uh, that is a, a, quite a change for uh, Martin McLaren. As I said before, he had been uh, 
uh, defeated in 1966, he came back again in 1970, and now he is out. Uh, so here's the Labour gains so far. They're Lincoln from Dick Deverne, and now the familiar names Nelson and Cone, Rossendale, Oxford, Rochester and Chatham, Southampton Test, Ipswich, Peterborough, Bristol Northwest, Bolton West, and Ilford North. And a recount in marginals, Northampton South, we're waiting for that, which might well be in that list. Let's look at that Peterborough result. This is one that we normally get, of course, uh, on the second day. But this time, Mr. Ward, who has fought patiently there, has run Sir Harmon Nichols to many recounts in the past. This time he's taken it, partly, I think, by population changes. Labour have taken Birmingham Selly Oak, I'm told now. Selly Oak, that's Harold Gurdon's seat in Birmingham, and that's a, a bad reverse for the Conservatives. That's the first one outside the area that Bob was talking about. It needed a 3.1% swing to go. And I understand that Mr. Wilson is now talking to Michael Charlton at Heighton. So let's go to Heighton. Uh, Prime Minister, um, how do you interpret the results so far? It's a little early. I am gratified at some of the gains that we have made. I'd have liked more. I'm disappointed at some that we haven't. I've been in most of the constituencies we've gained in the last uh, three or four weeks. And I, I felt that, you know, it was beginning to happen. I think the only one I've been in which we haven't gained was in Ford country. Is it uh, uncertain, do you think, whether you're going to have an overall majority, or do you think you will have? I'll leave that to the pundits. But, but, uh, I'll leave that to the pundits. I don't pretend... I have no pretensions to punditry. They're usually wrong. I think uh, we could have an overall majority, even if, if we just missed it. Uh, I do... I, I think that it, it could provide a period of parliamentary stability. I cannot see all the third and fourth and fifth and splinter parties uniting in a kind of opposition coalition of nationalist unity. Unholy alliances. You, you, you I have used that phrase, yes. 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 I, I can't see them uniting in that to provoke a third election. We shall carry out our program, our manifesto. We shall give priority, of course, to putting on the statute book all the things that we have said, like public ownership of land, legislation against discrimination against women. Will some of those things receive the, uh, greater emphasis theory. than others? Well, you'd better wait for the Queen's speech, which uh, my colleagues and I will be meeting to prepare the Queen's speech for the new Parliament uh, as early as possible, after we've had a good weekend sleep. Do you think it's a wise result from the British public? I mean, they seem to have wanted majority government. Um, is it a wise result in that they've given you a very small majority, which might be an indication that they would wish you to steer a middle course? There is no one in British history with more experience of small majorities than myself. I'd have liked a bigger one, of course. And, uh, but assuming that we have a workable parliamentary position, I think this is what the country wants. But there was a lot of speculation that a large majority would produce quite a different uh, kind of government. I mean, in not those... At all, in, in... Not at all. What we believe to be right, what we said in our manifesto, we shall do. I'm... Not at all. There's a kind of silly theory that I would like a small majority rather than a large one. I prefer a large one. I can cope with it. I know there'll be more difficulties and troubles, uh, but I'm used to that. You said uh, only a few months ago when you went back into Downing Street the morning after that we've got a job to do and it can only be done uh, as one people. Um, now, you were making noises of moderation and restraint here tonight when we heard you earlier at the declaration of, of the poll. Can you give us an idea of, of what it is you I've always, essentially want to say to well, the I've British always, people yes, now? Yes, thank you. I've, I've always believed that, that we can only do it as one people working together. Not merely working together to, to, to get the exports and everything we need, but ready to make sacrifices for the people within our community who are the hardest hit because they can't help themselves. I said that then, I meant it. I believe we have uh, begun to work as one people. An election is a rather special period, which is inevitably politically divisive. But I take, I think, a certain degree of satisfaction, and I'm sure other party leaders do too, that while we've disagreed fundamentally, and that's what democracy is about, on how to tackle the crisis, who are the right people, what are the right policies, we all agree on the dimensions of the national crisis. And I think the country wants, to, to get, wants us, or would have wanted any other government, to get on with the job. 
with, uh, shall we say, without the uncertainty that we've had for the last six months that there might be another election around the corner. But on that very point, there was something in the manifesto which aroused a good deal of comment when, it, when one of the sentences in it said that there was no meeting point in differing philosophies. That was in the Labour manifesto, and I think a lot of people interpreted that as a, as a, as a kind of them and us situation. A lot of people used uh, it. I don't know whether they interpreted it rightly or not. I think what it meant, and it really is the answer to this, all this talk about people coming from different parties or the ragtag and bobtail approach to the so-called government of national unity, uh, I think it was really an answer to that. But <clears throat> I believe that within the national community, as opposed to the Westminster political hothouse, there's a great desire to work together. I spend a lot of time with industrialists. I always have. I've always been more interested in industry than finance. I try to understand finance. Conservatives are more finance-minded, though I've spent a lot of time meeting with people in the city in, in, in the last seven months. And I believe there is a great desire in management and in unions and in people who are doing essential community services to work together for the nation. And I think whatever government had come in as a result of this election would have had the duty to mobilize that, to, to release the energies of people, but also to steer them into channels of national unity. That's what I'm going to concentrate on now. And I think the statement I made to the Times newspaper, which they featured rather even larger than I thought what I said deserved, uh, was a, an indication of what I have in mind. Just a couple of days before the election, I think the CBI put out a statement saying the social contract was only with the trade unions, not with the, the, the management side well, of industry. Well, that's not true. You know, when I went to Downing Street last March, the first thing I said when I got through those portals was to say, I want to see the TUC tomorrow at 12 o'clock, if that's convenient to them, and the CBI at 2.30, if that's convenient to them. And I did. And I want to get down, not only through NEDI, which I chair from time to time, but by direct talks with them to see what we can do together to pull the country through. What do you think's been the Trump issue? In, not in only the, the CBI, may I say. Mm. They represent certain people. There are very many other people on what one might call the management side that I think have got to be brought into this national effort. What do you mean by that? You, going to, you mean you want to expand it? And I mean, it sounds rather like the sort of thing Mr. Heath was talking about, bringing in people from outside. No, no, no I'm not talking about that. Mm. I believe in having elected people in the government in the main. But uh, no, what I mean is that, uh, for example, there are small businesses. Now, the CBI does speak for small business. I know that. And from time to time, the small businesses take charge over the larger businesses. But Harold Lever's been giving a lot of thought and said something in the election, it wasn't much reported, about a desire to try... And, and Tony Benn has said it. Tony Benn's a great believer in small businesses, despite his, the legend about him, to try and see what we can do to help small businesses. There is a problem, not only the liquidity cash flow problem, there is a problem. We want to... Well, to use the phrase I use, they're useful people. Frank Lawn said earlier tonight in the declaration of his poll that he thought that the common market was the Trump issue for you. Do you think it was? Who can say? I don't think it was the main issue in the election. It was an important one. We have said that people will have the final right of decision, which indeed Mr. Heath had promised in 1970, and which will ensure that they do. I think it's an important issue, and I think it's been a cross-party issue. My own party's divided on this. I make no bones about it. The Conservatives are divided, though their cabinet, unfortunately, was not representative of the whole party, although the Conservative voters, <coughs> the Liberals are divided. Many anti-marketeers have voted Liberal because they found it a, a way of expressing themselves on the market and the country is divided. I Still, think do you the think country really? must decide. Oh, yes, Fund, very much so. Very much. And the last poll I saw showed 54% in favour, provided you could get satisfactory terms, which I know you I'm glad you say that. I'm objective. glad you say that, you know, because for, you about, think it's worse than that? for about three years I was totally traduced for even saying the terms were important. Uh, you would just look um, back at the articles in the Times and all the other papers <coughs> to say that I was the biggest swine who ever lived uh, for saying that the terms matter. Now, a majority of the country agrees with me. I feel mildly reassured about that, and that's why the renegotiations are so important. But do you think the country really is as divided as it was? I mean, would you say yes. there is a majority for entry if the terms are all right? Uh, that's what the country will decide. We what do you think? Give them a the chance. Well, it depends on the, it depends on the renegotiations. That, and we are pursuing them with great vigour. The common market has become a shambles. That's admitted across the channel as well as here. We've been fighting for British interests on the 
question of beef mountains and all that. But the objective is still to go in. I mean, if people the ask you, where's the nation is, going? The objective yeah. is to make a success of the hmm. renegotiations. But we have put very tough terms on the table for renegotiation. I wouldn't like to forecast the outcome. Um, can we spend the last couple of minutes? People, I'm sure, we want to know from you now the election is, is over or uh, almost over. Uh, how I wouldn't say that. There's a lot of results to come, you know. <laughs> How bad are things in Britain? I mean, bad. can you be a little more venturesome than you, you've been? Well, it is the gravest economic crisis, the gravest national crisis since the war. In terms of the threat of unemployment, which I have stressed rather a lot in this election, it is, in a sense, the gravest we've faced since 1931. I believe things have improved somewhat. We've got more of a control on the situation. I don't just mean the government, I mean the country, since March. This crisis was endemic and upon us a year ago, even before oil began to hit us, even before the fighting in the Middle East. I think on trade, payments, exports, we have made great progress. We've halved the deficit, if you exclude the oil factor, and no country, or hardly any country, can uh, hope to deal with that. Unemployment, the rise in unemployment, we were told, was going to be catastrophic. That is moderating a little. The cost of living problem, it's still a serious problem, it's still worsening, but it is, that's also being moderated, partly as a result of actions the government have taken. We have about half the rise in it, and that's reason for hope. It's reason for proving that Britain can do it. And uh, contrary to all the gloom and doom we hear in the city, and we've heard in the election, we can do it, but it's going to be a hell of a job. For how long? I'd have said two years and a bit more. What? Not three, two and a half. Well, I don't want to forecast. I think it's going to be very, very hard slogging for a couple of years, and I have not disguised that from the people in this election or in the last election. Mr. Wilson, thank you. And that is a very interesting and remarkable interview that Mr. Wilson has just given. His three aims, national unity, success in renegotiating membership of the European common market, but tough terms, and a hell of a job, a hard slog for two years and a bit more. And that is the mood in which Mr. Wilson will return to number 10 Downing Street. It is not being a good night for the Liberals. They have failed to take either Newbury or Richmond, which were two in the south which they had to take if they were to move ahead. The Conservatives have held on in Pembroke, a marginal in Wales, and they've also held on in marginal Glasgow, Cathcart. Even more important, Northampton South, where there was a recount, has stayed in the Conservative column. But the big casualty of the night is that of Tom Boardman, the former Chief Secretary to the Treasury and Minister for Industry, 1972-74, who has lost his seat in Leicester South. I think we have, sorry, I think we have a declaration of Croydon, Bob. Shall we go there? I am going to announce the results of the voting in the Croydon Northwest constituency and we'll give the votes cast for the candidates in alphabetical order. The votes cast at this election are as follows. Stanley John Bowden. Labour. 14,556. Peter John Holland. National Front. 1,049. William Henry Pitt. Liberal. 6,563. Robert George Taylor. Conservative. 16,035. And Robert George Taylor is elected as the member for the Croydon Northwest constituency. Well, Conservatives holding their seat there in Croydon Northeast, but they've lost Wellin and Hatfield. That's another big casualty of the night, Lord Balneal. For the third time, I have the privilege of proposing a very sincere vote. I think we will leave Croydon. We're not too surprised there. Uh, uh, Bob McKenzie. Uh, just one point I wanted to make after listening to Mr. Wilson. If he returns to number 10 for presumably a full parliament, he will then have been prime minister longer than anybody in the 20th century in this country. It'll be over 11 years, outpacing Asquith eight years, Churchill eight years, Macmillan six years, and so on. 
And indeed, only Gladstone and Salisbury, the late part of the 19th century, will rival him in terms of length of office. It's really quite a remarkable moment. He's very aware of these historical parallels, I know, and he will have the 20th century record if he returns to number 10 and has a full parliament. But it is a very remarkable record indeed, because mm. people used to say at one time that when prime ministers were defeated, they didn't come back yeah. in this country. Mm. The population since the war had got so accustomed to a new face and this emphasis, which Mr. Wilson himself encouraged at one time. Well, there he is, still surviving. While you were saying this, two key marginals came in, and the Labour Party has held on in Wellingborough and in Uxbridge. These are two seats in Labour. Conservative Party. Conservative, the Conservative Party, Conservatives yes. held on. But I do want to say that I am now quite clear about the result of this election. We've now got 330 results in, and almost all the uncertainties have now been removed. The Liberals are plainly going to slip back. They may pick up a seat or two in the country returns tomorrow, but they're going to have probably less than the 14 seats they had at the last election, though they probably will end up with eight or nine. The Scottish Nationalists, well, we've now got 12 seats in from Scotland, and not a seat has changed hands. Now, it's not saying the Scottish Nationalists won't have some gains, quite likely at the Conservatives' expense, but they're not going to make that breakthrough that is going to change the situation. When we said that the it was likely that they would, the Labour Party would get 325 or 328 seats, the figure varied around. That was when we got 100 seats in. Well, that figure stayed steady, and we've now got 330 seats in, and the great uncertainties of a Liberal breakthrough or of a, still more of a Scottish Nationalist breakthrough have been removed. They may get some seats, but not any very large number of seats. And therefore, I think we can say with absolute confidence that the Labour Party is going to be back in with a clear and workable majority. Remember, Mr Heath won in 1970 with 330 seats. At the moment, it looks like, say, 327 for the Labour Party. It won't make them safe against the sort of by-election losses that they had in 1967 to 8, but it will give them two or three years with really complete assurance, unless there's some internal split, they are in power. Uh, Mr. Wilson was very interesting indeed, I thought, there when he was talking about Europe, and so indeed was Mr. Jenkins refusing to be drawn, because that certainly is one of the rocks which could lie in the way of the Labour ship. Let's see some of the Scottish results that David was talking about. Glasgow Cathcart, Teddy Taylor, Glasgow, Spring, uh, Glasgow uh, Central, and uh, Glasgow Prophet. The Nationalists there only went up 3% in Glasgow Cathcart. They went up 5% uh, in Glasgow Central. They went up 10% uh, uh, in Glasgow Proven. And so they were second place in two seats, but nowhere near winning these safe Glasgow seats, these two safe Labour seats, one Conservative marginal in Glasgow. Well, they were second in Proven before. And here's uh, George Younger, a promising young Conservative spokesman on Scottish affairs, returned in air. That might conceivably have gone to Labour had there been a very big swing. Glasgow Springburn, again, where the Scottish Nationalists are used to running second, and Glasgow Shettleston. And each of those three seats, the Nationalists went up about between 5 and 6%, nothing like as much as some of the polls had suggested was going to be the Nationalist increase in Scotland. So, so Maya Galpern, a former Lord Provost of Glasgow. Now we're going over to uh, Edinburgh North, Alex Fletcher, a promising young Tory MP who took the seat at a by-election, Dumfries, Hector Munro, very much in favour of the Lions tour in South Africa, and Willie Ross, Kilmarnock, the Secretary of State for Scotland. Nationalists up 10%, 8%, 15%, quite a big increase in in Kilmarnock, much the biggest we've had in the nine results we've shown from Scotland, but not breakthrough amount. And here, Liberals holding Cardigan. Well, that's one that they took last time. Geraint Howells, who is the head of the Liberal Party in Wales, president of the Liberal Party in Wales, I believe, he's held on to that seat which he took from Labour. The Labour, had, Labour Party had hoped to win that back, and they haven't. Ellison Morgan didn't succeed. But here's a big out. result from Scotland, uh, David. Angus South has gone to the SNP. Now, this is Jock Bruce Gardine in South Angus. This is one that the Scottish Nationalists had some serious hopes of, and they've tipped it over. Yes, well, the Nationalists may well, in the northeast of Scotland, pick up two or three in the north, two or three more seats, that they would all be at Conservative expense. Uh, there is, of course, a nearby Labour seat in Dundee West, which could go if the Nationalists are making headway in that part of the country. Yes, and then a little further down, you've got the Stirlingshire seats we're still waiting for. We've had one three polls suggesting one of them won't go, but we are still a little sceptical about polls at this well, moment. Well, that's the first news for the Scottish Nationalists. And I think now David Lomax is talking to Jeremy Thorpe down in North Devon after the Liberal leader's successful return, but with some Liberal reverses already coming in. Mr. Thorpe, what is your reaction to the general drop there has been so far in the Liberal vote? Oh, I think it's much too early to say. At the end of the day, we've got to see how many seats we have. 
We've just held the Isle of Wight, we've held North Devon, we've held Rochdale. Far too early to say. And it's only people who don't get out into the constituencies on the ground or who can't think for themselves, who feed things into computers and tell us what we're all going to do before the votes have even been counted. But overall, so far, there have been a large number of seats where the Liberal proportion of the vote has mm. fallen, 3 so, 5%. Mm. Does that concern you at all? It means absolutely nothing under the British electoral system. One could even drop two million votes and treble one seatage in the House of Commons. It's a sort of the nearest thing to a casino, our electoral system, but we can have far too early to say. What's your reaction to the possibility of a majority Labour government? Well, that's a matter for the electors. Uh, obviously, I'm not in favour of it. I'm not in favour of a Tory majority either. That's why I'm in business as a Liberal. And uh, I think the Labour Party are going to have some pretty appalling economic problems to face. And uh, I happen to think on the basis of their present economic policies, they haven't got the right policies to deal with them. But if the electorate choose that, I as a good Democrat will accept it. And as the leader of an opposition party, we shall be responsible. We shall support what we think is in the national interest and likewise oppose what we think is against it. But with perhaps the prospect of a Labour government for the next five years, what do you think that might do to the Liberal Party uh, generally? A, I don't know, and B, any man who prophesied what was going to happen five years ahead in politics would be an awful fool. Thank you very much. Mr Thorpe, and there's better news for Mr Thorpe. In the Cone Valley, Mr Richard Wainwright has held that seat for the Liberals. Good news for the Conservatives in Hornsey, where we had reported a recount. That seat has been held by the Conservative, Mr Rossi, who, of course, is number two to Mrs Thatcher and the Conservatives' ideas about environment and housing. Perhaps 9.5% mortgages helped him there. Norman St. John Stevens back at Chelmsford. What I thought was interesting in that interview with Mr Thorpe, David, was that he did seem to me to be calling into question, once again, the voting system. Again, he called it a casino. Now, the question is... Could national unity continue if the Labour Party were to put through some policies which Mr Thorpe and the Conservatives don't like, if in fact they're doing it with what is now very obvious to everybody, a staggering minority of votes? Well, I think one can see Mr Thorpe's grievance on these figures in front of us. Mr Thorpe is going to end up with five million votes and probably ten seats. It'll be just as bad as 16 million, six million votes and 14 seats. And he'll say it's unfair, and the other parties will say it's a system that has worked and that does give us n clear majority governments. It is a grievance for people, but uh, they will just say it works and nothing will be done about it. It is fair to note that the only country in Europe that counts votes this way, and understandably, I think, for the party that loses, a third party, it is grossly unfair, but that is the way it works in this country, and I don't think it'll be changed in my lifetime anyway. Oh, you're as despondent as all that. <laughs> well, well, we can't, haven't got Canada here yet. Let's look at that uh, Scottish nationalist result in Angus. This is a, this is a uh, reverse for Mr. Jock Bruce Gardine. Uh, Mr. Andrew Welsh, he's only 30. He's an assistant principal teacher at Stirling High School. And here he is now in the House of Commons. Labour lose their deposit. The nationalists go up 7%. The Conservatives, Jock Bruce Gardine, goes down 10%. Labour goes down 3% to losing their deposit, and of course the Liberals' bottom lose their deposit. And here we have the fourth recount going on at Plymouth Drake. Now there's a situation with the Conservatives in some difficulty. That's despite, of course, the great row going on about dockyards generally. And uh, now I think, uh, Graham, uh, is it true that uh, your prediction is indeed settling down, as uh, David is suggesting? Well, it's been remarkably stable. Here it is, Labour 325, Conservatives 272, Liberals 10 and the others 28. And the uncertainty is going. But we are not yet at the point where we can be absolutely certain that Labour is going to get the 318 needed for an overall majority. They're virtually there, but we need uh, one or two more results yet before we can be quite sure. Where particularly are they from now, Graham? Scotland? Dundee particular, yes, that's Dundee, right. Yeah, Dundee yeah. in particular, both seats. Well, that's, uh, and the uh, Conservatives have held Reading South, that's Dr. Gerald Vaughan. That was one that would again have gone had the Labour sweep been more convincing. And in Wales, the Conservatives holding on to Conway. That was one which they got back uh, a few years ago, but always one that uh, is worth looking at. Uh, I think we'll get some results now from up uh, Merseyside Way. And... Uh, Very Liverpool. big swings to Labour. Liverpool-Kirkdale, that's the biggest swing we've had tonight, 6%. 
uh, to Labour in Liverpool Kirkdale. Uh, with the, uh, and there is the confirmation of Darwin. I think we did Mr Fletcher Cook uh, a little bit of an injustice. The Scottish Nationals have held on to Dundee East. We have that result through. We're expecting the result from West shortly. And that's one that the Scottish Nationals hope to pick up. Let's go. I think we have a chance now for Dundee East. Let's go and hear this. George Mason, 15,137. William Connell Walker, 7,784. Robert Garden Wilson, 22,000. Well, that was the acclamation for Gordon Wilson, who is the nationalist expert on oil, and he is back very safely indeed in his seat in Dundee. And there must be some hopes uh, in the SNP that they can pick up the other seat. should say that the Gaelic mod has been on in Dundee his past uh, little while, and they're all a little bit unhappy there, simply because they weren't given absentee votes. So I guess there's been a few canvassers for doing it differently in Dundee, what effect that has had. Uh, we are now where uh, there's uh, news of uh, Jim Callaghan holding Cardiff South East, the Foreign Secretary, and of course with a great deal to say in this renegotiation of European matters. But with the news that the Scottish National Party have held their seat in Dundee East and have now taken the seat in South Angus, and that must make one or two people shiver 12 miles round. Uh, some Conservatives there principally, but also the Labour Party in Stirlingshire. We will wait and see whether they can make further progress. So I think we have the result from Dundee East. And there it is, Gordon Wilson, back very comfortably indeed this time. The Liberal losing his deposit. An 8% jump in the poll for the SNP, one at Conservatives' expense. Mr McKinn, or Machin, I think he is, uh, 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 holding on to his vote, but yeah. he, he thinks suffers from a disadvantage in that he came from England. He's an engineer, George from Sheffield, Hitchin, I believe, and yes. uh, he uh, probably not quite the atmosphere in which to fight a seat at this particular time. Let's have a look at some more results now from the northwest: Stockport South, Maurice Orbach in West Houghton, and Ince clear Labour majorities. I'm sorry, I was giving the wrong results there. Here we now do have uh, West Houghton, Ince, and uh, Farnworth. All very uniform behaviour, no great deviations from the standard pattern of a swing, around 2% in most cases, a few in the very industrial seats, going up to 3 or 4%. And the marginals in the south, lower figures. And in Blackpool North, Mr. Norman Miss Campbell, earning the right to sit on the Conservative uh, conference front bench. Barry and Radcliffe, I understand, has now gone to Labour, while we look at the Liverpool Toxteth and Clitheroe results. But Barry and Radcliffe has now tipped over after many recounts. I think I'd like to talk about Barry and Radcliffe now. That's Michael Fiddler, uh, who was uh, from Salford, a business consultant. And he was patron of the All-Party Committee for the Release of Soviet Jury. He is gone. Frank White, a member of the General and Municipal Workers' Union, taking Berry and Radcliffe. So that there's little doubt that Labour has done pretty well in that part of the country, David. It has. Though it's the picked up the marginal hard. seats. It's picked up the super marginals that it was hoping for. Did you see there that Labour has held Luton East? Well, it was rather surprising that it was in danger. But we did hear there was a recount. Now we know that they're in. The Conservatives have made no gains. But they've held on. The interesting things are the seats they've done so particularly well in work, particularly, as Mr. Wilson said in his thing, in Ford country, Upminster and Bromford. Very low swings indeed. Uh, well, they held on, of course, in Northampton South, and equally there, I thought it was quite interesting in Luton, that might have some influence on the court line. That was the court line uh, affair. That was the airfield where the holidaymakers had it's their more disasters. more important, it's where there was a Vox the Vauxhall plant is, and the Vauxhall strike was averted. Well, now. The Conservatives uh, held Reading South, that's so right, Reading North is the marginal one. And uh, now, have we some more results? Well, uh, with, uh, we happen to we'll give you some more results shortly, but Robin Day now is talking to Harold Lever. Uh, good, good morning, Mr. Lever. Good morning, Mr. Day. Uh, may I uh, suggest that your pleasure at Labour's uh, prospect of a small working majority is sobered by the enormity of the tasks which you now have to cope with. I think that that would not be an unfair comment. 
May I also, may I remind you and everybody of a statement you made yesterday morning, which didn't get the publicity it deserved, if I may say so. You said we must do everything possible at home, but if we do not succeed in raising the level of international cooperation massively and soon, the world will be engulfed in a financial and economic crisis with devastating results on our standard of living, employment, indeed on our whole social structure. I quote it because it was a very important statement, and you're by nature an optimist, aren't you, Mr? I, I think that is right. Now, what are the things that you've got to do on the international level to avoid this devastating consequences? You've got to get the whole of the oil pricing problem solved by some broad agreement between the oil producers and the oil consumers. At the present time, the burden that those prices and the supply system is placing on the world monetary system is such that it can only have the gravest consequences after not a long period of time. Are you saying, Mr. Lever, that whatever a Labour government may be able to do at home, and let us assume it's, it's successful insofar as social contract is concerned and all these other things, the, the international problems could wreck anything that you can do? That is right. I think that if the international situation were to go badly astray, meet some major mishap, nothing that a Labour government or any government in Britain alone could do could save the British people from suffering very grave misfortune. Then what is the, how do you get the recycling of the oil? Does this depend on international deals with, with or the Americans or no. with, with our diplomacy or what? I think it's uh, the effort that is made by the great nations of the world to come to a constructive agreement with the oil producers and I may say that but not being a party bigot, I may say that I really believe that Harold Wilson, Jim Callaghan and Dennis Healy have played a very constructive part in seeking to deal with this crucial problem in the interest of the British people and indeed of the world. Aren't you being a bit modest, Mr Lever? Haven't you played a part in these matters? Well, I've done my best. Mr Lever, I have to move on. I'd like to talk to you more, as you know, but uh, yeah. goodbye now. Goodbye. Very sobering thoughts from Mr. Harold Lever. Uh, the Conservatives may have lost Oxford, but they have held Cambridge with Mr. David Lane. And so, with the time now getting on into the wee small hours, seven, eight minutes past two, we believe that this is still the likely result of the general election. Labour, 324. Conservative, 272. Liberal, 11. Others, that's the Scottish Nationalists and chiefly the Ulster Unionists, 28. And we... And we believe that uh, Labour will have still an overall majority, a narrow one, but we would still like to hear from some more seats in Scotland to see if anything is going wrong there. A little reassurance for Labour in Scotland. They held Edinburgh Leith, the Lord Advocate, Mr Ronald King Murray. Again, that might have been a long shot for the Nationalists, but nevertheless, Labour held it. Here's a declaration coming from Croydon North East. I am going to announce the results of the voting in the Croydon North East constituency and will give the votes cast for the candidates in alphabetical order. The votes cast at this election are as follows. David Howard Simpson, Labour, 15,787. Patrick Thomas Streeter, 7,228. William Stringer, Independent, 451. Bruce Bernard Wetherill, Conservative, 17,938. And Bruce Bernard Wetherill is elected as the member for the Croydon North East constituency. Bernard Wetherill is a master tailor. He's also the opposition deputy chief whip, so if it were not to be a majority Mr. government, he'd have a very I'm tough sure time. A 1.6% swing. The full figures for Bernard Wetherill there, holding his seat and, uh, in Croydon uh, North East and coming back to, in any circumstances, quite a busy House of Commons. Liberals down 6% there. And uh, for more news about what's been happening in the South East, here's Sue again. Well, let's have a look at the figures so far. We've got 43 results in in the GLC area with one gain for Labour, 29 results for Conservative, and, of course, that one loss. Looking over at the Home Counties map, 
12 seats in for Labour with three gains and 28 seats in for Conservative, obviously those three losses. Let's take a closer look now at the GLC map. It's beginning to look rather as it did when I showed it to you at the beginning of the evening. That is the reds and the blues moving back into their same old places. The paler areas around here are the constituencies as yet undeclared. But meantime we've got of course Ian Mikado back in Bethnal Green and Bow. We've got James Wellbeloved back in Erith and Crayford. And of course there is the one Labour gain. Mrs Millie Miller moving in on Ilford North. We show that to you by raising it to show you that it's a gain. The one gain in the whole GLC area as we have it at the moment. As far as the Liberals are concerned they lost out on all their hopes. They didn't get in at Richmond, neither did they get in at Sutton and Cheam or at Orpington. So more or less as it was when I showed it to you about two and a half hours ago. Let's have a look now at the home counties map. Again, the raised signs to show their gains. Rochester and Chatham over there, Peggy Fenner out and Robert Bean in. Oxford here, a victory for Evan Luard, Monty Woodhouse out. And of course, Wellen and Hatfield, again, again. Lord Balneal has been ousted by Helene Middleweek, who in fact got married during her campaign and has spent her, hun her campaign actually honeymooning, so it looks as if that paid off. Well now let's have a look at the men who are actually holding their marginal seats and actually defying the polls and the pundits. There's David Medell, a young advertising executive who returns as Conservative for Bedfordshire South. Arthur Latham has again held the marginal seat of Paddington. Ivor Stanbrook has now defeated both the Lubbocks in Orpington. And Paul Channon has held on to South End West. And finally, hard, hardly a marginal chap, but going back to grace the House of Commons is, of course, Norman St. John Stevers, going back for Chelmsford. He was once, he was, in fact, recently voted the world's most elegant politician, a very well-deserved title, I think. Back to you, Alistair. I was just wondering, Sue, whether he's got any competition in that. <laughs> I shouldn't think he has. Nobody could compete. <laughs> well, uh, some people are not quite as hardy as we are here. Uh, they've uh, actually had three recounts in Plymouth Drake, they don't intend to declare tonight. They're chucking their hands in. Their fourth recount will start, we're told, at 9.30 in the morning. And, of course, we'll be back here at 9 o'clock in the morning. So, that's uh, some sensible people down in Plymouth Drake. They're off to bed, more part of their counting fingers in the morning. Here's some London results from Woolwich East, from Harrow Central and Lambeth Central. No surprises. Bigger swings in the centre than the suburbs. And now from Hackney Central, Hammersmith North, and Hackney South and Shoreditch. That's, That's uh, George Brown's brother. Big swings in the East End in the safe Labour seats. James Well, beloved, Erith and Crayford, uh, Peckham and Hackney North and Stoke Newington, David Weitzman. Nothing really much to say about these. These are coming just up to expectation. If only Obviously. Labour could have had those swings in the marginals. They'd be doing very well tonight. And still out there, Thurrock, Hugh DeLarge, and uh, there in Luton West, Brian Sedgemore, Thanet East, Jonathan Aiken. In Epping Forest, Mr. John Briggs Davidson. In Basildon, Mr. Eric Moonman and in South End East, Sir Stephen McCadden. Much lower swings in the area, not far from Dagenham and the Ford's plant. And there's uh, Mr. Wilson, uh, justified by what has happened in Fordland. One wonders whether, ah, and here's the news from Scotland that Dundee West has been held by Labour. So that's one that will give great comfort to Mr. Wilson, uh, in fact, that probably does suggest that part at least of the nationalist thrust in Scotland has been blunted and uh, Labour has held on to one of the ones that the nationalists hope to take from them. There may still be trouble for the Conservatives of course but that I think does help almost signally David to hold up our prediction. With 27 seats in the nationalist vote is only up by 9 percent. They need it to be up by 15 or 20 percent if they were to make a really big breakthrough. And here's the Battersea South result, and here's Mr. Perry, who is a Labour whip, and he, of course, would have a busy time were it not to be a majority government. Uh, here we are, but we are now still predicting a majority. And uh, really, it's now going to take some surprising results to disconcert us and to disconcert our prediction that Labour is safely back.
And here is Labour's advance towards that overall majority, which Mr. Wilson wants. Labour 244 seats with net 14 gains. Conservatives 151 seats with uh, 14 net losses. Uh, Labour just clicked up a gain there to 15. And uh, here we have the Liberals losing one. That's Hazel Grove to the Conservative. Others are getting a bit messy. The Scottish Nationalists have gained one from Conservatives. Labour has gained one from, uh, uh, from Dick Tavern. And so that others problem needs a little bit, uh, others column needs a little bit of interpretation. Well now, uh, Bob, how is the swingometer standing up to these trials well, of the night? I was going to say, if, if one of the disasters of the night has been the opinion polls, really, which all of them, including the one we talked about rather a lot at the beginning, seem to point to a huge Labour overall majority, one of the quiet successes of the uh, night has been the swingometer. It works astonishingly well, thanks to the uniformity of opinion, movements of opinion, which David Butler talked about earlier. There's something just over a 2% swing to Labour. Giving Labour, say, 50 seats, less, just under the 60 here, 50 seats lead over the Conservatives, but with the others running almost exactly where they were last time, because I left this up from the beginning, 37 Liberals and others uh, at the end of the last election, perhaps 38 or so now, that gives just the 10, 12 lead uh, overall for Labour, which we're anticipating. So that, in fact, at no expense, the swingometer has arrived at a prediction and had it up there quite a while ago, uh, which uh, is turning out to be astonishingly accurate. It doesn't mean yet, I think, by the way, and I don't think one should go nap on a situation where Labour has, on our prediction, specific prediction, a six-seat um, lead overall. Uh, that's not what you could call a certain lead for a parliament, for example. Uh, and I, we must therefore be rather careful about this because the volatility of the electorate is such that Labour coming back with, say, 324 uh, just has that kind of margin which could, could erode very quickly well, in the event of, of a sharp economic crisis and, in terms of by -elections. And in so, Mr. Wilson's own words, uh, a hell of a job for two years and a bit more. Right. So so we, and we see the tremendous turnover in by-elections. If you look back on it, the Attlee government of 1945 lost no by-elections at all in five or six years. Now we see governments losing bang, bang, bang in by-elections. So this is going to be a precarious situation and worrisome in the sense that it might tend to make the government concentrate on the problem of political popularity to avoid losing by-elections at a moment one wants tough government of whatever party. That's very possible. I thought Mr. Wilson was also acute when he did indicate what a rag bag the opposition would be if they were going to try to unseat him on any particular issue. Because the Liberals, I would have thought now, although Mr. Thorpe has got, as you've been saying, an awful lot of votes, uh, his breakthrough has not happened, and therefore he must now be slightly discredited as the saviour of the country. Uh, Mr. Heath has fought an unsuccessful campaign. It hasn't been as bad as was predicted by others and by us in our moments of pure entertainment. Uh, and equally, it may be that the Scottish nationalists are not the threat to Labour in Scotland that they looked like this morning. Mm -hmm. So they can't be in too good nick. Could we add one further point about the ironies of the electoral system? The Labour Party is running at 43% of the electoral of the votes cast so far. That's the same percentage on which they lost power in 1970. In other words, you, they, they're coming back with a majority, having lost power with that share of the vote in 1970. While you were saying and Mr. that... Mr. James Callaghan is now the Foreign Secretary, is waiting to talk to Robin Day. Robin? Good morning, you... Foreign Secretary. Ah, yes, Mr. Day, I can hear you. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. You did very well in, uh, in Cardiff South East. Your majority went up from uh, 7,000 odd to 11,000, nearly 12,000. Yes, yes, yes. How do you account for that, apart from your own charisma? No, I think you've got to ask the electors, I'm sure. I don't know why, but it's, very, it's a very pleasant thing to be elected ten times in a row, you know, by your own people. Uh, with that satisfaction in mind, uh, Mr. Callaghan, do you find yourself uh, sobered with the thought of the problems which the new government has got to deal with? Yes, I've just made a speech to this effect uh, to the assembled multitude outside the City Hall in Cardiff here. Could you summarise it for us? Because unfortunately, with all the other things coming in, we, we missed it. Well, quite simply, we've got to make the social contract work in all its aspects. I don't think anybody in this country really expects a better time this winter. Therefore, you need a government that is going to protect those who need it and look after those who want succour. 
I think this is the main uh, job that we have to do this Mr. winter. Mr. Harold Lever has just been uh, talking to us. Who's he that? Said, Mr. Harold Lever has just oh, been yes. talking to us, your friend. I expect he got back, didn't he? Uh, yes, he got back. But what he said was this, that though, of course we, you, he, we want to do all the things which uh, you've just spoken of, that all these would be of no avail unless we get the international uh, agreement on this problem of oil and the problem of the oil money and so on. Do you, do you see uh, good prospects of getting that uh, problem dealt with as Foreign Secretary? Yes, I think there is some prospect of it because I think that uh, Dr Kissinger certainly understands the need for this. Uh, and when Dennis Healy met him and the other foreign ministers and finance ministers of France and Germany and Japan a fortnight ago, this is what they were concerned with. I've always argued throughout the whole of this campaign that whilst we've got to do a lot of things ourselves domestically, that on the international front we've got to get remedies there too if we're to be wholly successful. Do you, one final point, Mr. Callahan, do you, do you, you're happy to stay as Foreign Secretary in the government? You don't see any changes coming ahead, do you? Mr. Day, if you were forming the administration, I'm not sure what my answer would be, but as it's Mr. Wilson, uh, the answer would be if he asked me, I should be very happy to stay. Uh, what do you think about the, the uh, apparent, uh, well, the real and apparent uh, drop in the uh, liberal impact in this campaign? It, it, would you agree that it seems to show, at any rate, the electorate seem to prefer majority government rather than... Uh, minority government. Yes, I think the Liberal vote was always a vote of dissatisfaction. There was never mu anything much positive about it. And I think that this government, uh, the Labour government, has satisfied its followers and a lot of other people that it has lived up to its promises. That's a, a, a victory for democracy too, you know. And so I think the Liberal vote was almost inevitably bound to fall back. I've got my own private speculation on uh, how many seats we shall get, and as I think I said before, I believe we shall get a, an overall majority. I haven't, I'm not up to date, I've been fighting a soldier's battle today in the fog and the mist and the rest of it, but I believe we shall get an overall majority. You said, you're, you, said you're, you had your own uh, private estimate. Uh, could, you, could you tell us what that is, because there aren't many people uh, listening? Aren't there? Yes, I tell you what I forecast. I forecast it the day before the election was announced. And indeed, if uh, it won't offend the Sabbatarians, I put a, I put a pound on it with Mikado, that well-known bookmaker who gives the worst odds in Britain. And I forecast that we would have an overall majority of between six and ten. That would give us about 322 seats. That's what I was working on. Do you know I put a bet with the same bookmaker yes. for almost exactly the same figure, well, ten? Well, there you are. It only goes to show we're both good judges of form. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Thank you very much, Thank sir, Foreign you. Secretary. Goodbye. Goodbye. Well, those two very happy men. There are one or two others around, uh, the Labour Party having taken Hemel Hempstead to put beside Welland and Hatfield in that part of uh, London and uh, North London. But uh, equally, there's a little trouble for Labour in Blythe, where Eddie, uh, where Eddie Milne is standing as an independent. He held the seat, of course, against the Labour Party back in February. Bad news for the Scottish Nationalists that they failed to take East Kilbride from Labour, and we have a recount in Croydon Central. It might be that the Conservative John Moore is in some trouble. That's just bringing you up to date during those uh, uh, talks. And we uh, understand there's a recount in Galloway. That is one of the Scottish Nationalists' hopes. It's Conservative held at the moment. A Conservative member, Mr John Bruce, has retired. And so the Scottish National Party may have some uh, considerable optimism about that recount. Remains to be seen. Uh, I think we have some Labour gains. Berry and Ratcliffe is one in uh, which Mr White Mr. Frank White took a seat from Michael Fiddler. Very low swing there, but of course it was enough in a very marginal seat. And a list of Labour's gains at Lincoln, that's Dick de Verne falling, and now the others from the Conservatives, Nelson and Cohn, Rossendale, Oxford, Rochester and Chatham, Southampton Test, Ipswich, Peterborough, Bristol North West, Bolton West, Ilford North, Birmingham Selly Oak, Leicester South, where of course Tom Boardman, the former minister, fell, and Wellin and Hatfield, Berry and Ratcliffe, and now Hemel Hempstead. And that's the Labour Roll of Honour tonight. No doubt it will appear prominently in the Labour newspapers. And uh, let's see what Labour is looking at now. 
This is what they're hoping to pick up. Burton, Brentford and Isleworth out in West London, Acton, North, uh, North West London, and Norfolk North West, which is Kings Lynn and part of the farming country there, but also a little bit of London because there's been a good deal of overspill in that direction. So I that's what the Bosworth the and Berwick and East Lothian are two others that they're certainly looking for. Berwick and East Lothian in Scotland, and we wait to see what effect the Nationalists and indeed the Liberals have in that seat. Now, uh, Bob McKenzie was talking a short while ago about uh, how the Labour Party has got back on the kind of vote that got it defeated in 1970. Uh, I just have word that Norfolk North West has been held by the Conservatives, so if the Labour Party had too much hope of that, they've lost it now. Uh, Michael Steed, uh, how do you see the overall vote situation? Well, we've been trying to work out what the final votes cast are going to be, and it looks as if Labour is going to have almost exactly 40% of the total votes cast, within 1% either way. It's running at 43% now, because it's the Labour seats which tend to declare early. And I think this is going to be a big talking point after the election. Mr Wilson is going to be back in Downing Street, Street on a popular vote of 60 to 40 against him. Now, do you think this really has an influence on the electorate? Uh, people like you, some, some newspapers and so on, do talk about this, but it's been going on in Britain for a very long time. And uh, it may be that people seek the comfort of a majority in the House of Commons rather than looking at this kind of vote. Well, I think it'll be a debate many times as whether or not Labour has got a mandate on this sort of vote to do some of the things it intends to do. Well, we haven't had a government for 50 years which has had less than about 44, 45% of the popular vote. We're now going to have one with 40%. Now, do you think the system is really discredited? This rather depends on how Mr Wilson goes into his tackling of the national crisis which he said now confronts us. I don't think we can say now the system is discredited, but I think it is going to be one part of the result uh, that Labour is so far behind on the popular vote. It's a and nice point, in fact, that in 1923, the last time this happened, when the Conservatives won a clear majority with only 38% of the vote, they felt that they had to go back for a new mandate when they wanted to mm. do something rather drastic on the subject of protection. Yes, well now that, that uh, we wait and see whether Mr Wilson wants to have a general election on the question of Europe. We've History does not repeat itself. No. We've also been having a very close look at where the Liberal vote is going because although, as David says, the swing is very even around the country, Liberals have been having much more varied ups and downs. Where Liberals were in a fairly close second, they have only dropped about 2%, which means that they might have a hope in one or two of the seats coming up tomorrow. Where Liberals have dropped back very badly by as much as 6% has been in the key marginals between Conservative and Labour. So it looks as the tactical voting story tonight has not been Liberals pinching Labour votes, but third-place Liberal voters in key marginals switching to the two main parties. Furthermore, we've been trying to see where they've been going and we reckon that a few more of them has been, have been going to the Conservative Party and it may well be that the Conservatives have held on to one or two seats as is Northampton, South, Upminster and Pembroke on squeezing the Liberal vote. Perhaps due to the final opinion polls. We just have one word from Bob McKenzie and I want to go uh, uh, for Attorney Wedgwood Ben. Just to make the point that it is I think always difficult for governments coming in, at the, the computer says with a five seat overall majority, that's the present prediction. And if you've got the kind of tough action that I believe the government will want to take in a whole lot of fields, it makes them nervous with five seats, and th there's a tendency to look for an opportunity to go to the country, etc. And that can't happen again very soon. Well, now, from a view inside the Cabinet, uh, Tony Benn is talking in Bristol to Mike Cockrell. Mr Benn, first of all, congratulations on increasing your majority. The Prime Minister said yesterday that the Labour movement was on the eve of a great victory. Why do you think that doesn't seem to be happening? Well, I don't know, because I haven't been watching the television exactly what the latest figures are. <coughs> My own feeling is that we've achieved one great thing uh, by our programme. We have abolished cynicism. Nobody in the whole of this campaign has expressed any doubt in asking questions at any meeting I've attended as to the gravity with which we put our programme forward. But I can't speak for the result nationally. I don't even know what the latest computer forecast is. Well, the latest computer forecast seems to be that uh, Labour will get a tiny overall majority or no overall majority at all. And you say that um, you seem to have banished cynicism. In fact, the turnout is down at this election. Well, uh, uh, turnout is selective, of course. You may get some party supporters not turning out and others turning out more strongly. But uh, I was making a rather different point which is that people have criticised our policy, but nobody has doubted our seriousness in putting it forward, and I think that is a very great gain. 
Do you think that if the Labour Party doesn't get its overall majority or gets a tiny majority, that will be because of or despite your policies? Uh, our policies, Labour policies. No, I mean yes. the policies of nationalisation uh, with which you're associated. Well, I've put forward, of course, throughout the policies approved by the conference, embodied in the manifesto, and endorsed by the cabinet and published in the government white paper. So I don't think these things are personal. I think they are matters uh, which belong to the party as a whole. Uh, their relevance, I do not doubt. And I have been saying throughout the election that whatever the outcome, I shall be saying the same thing after polling day as before. Whereas the Conservatives and Liberals appeared to be implying that they would adjust their policies according to the outcome of the election. And I think that is one reason, really, why people have known where they stood with us. But I can't forecast even now what the result will be. All I know is that we went on with our program even when we were a minority, and therefore if we are better than that, uh, we shall be, uh, find it easier to put forward our proposals. Thank you very much, Mr. Ben. And news that will please Mr. Wilson, Labour have held Glasgow Govan. That was one where Margot MacDonald was meant to take the seat for the Scottish Nationalists, and that would seem to help Mr. Wilson on his way to the overall majority. Although there is a recount in Lanark where Mrs. Judith Hart, who is his Minister for Overseas Development, might be in a little bit of trouble. We think Mr. Wilson is now at the Heighton Labour Club. Let's go there to see what's happening. Well, I don't know if you're listening to us, but here is uh, Mr. Wilson, very much in his own home country here at Heighton in the local Labour Club, which he opened himself in 1967, and where he's just got a rapturous welcome, sounding rather like the football terraces of this famous football city of Liverpool. And uh, probably through Ladies the and gentlemen. fog, you can see him up there at the back. I know my priorities. Mr. Arthur Smith, Mr. Prime Minister, fellow workers in the campaign. Once again, we have managed to increase Harold's majority in Heighton. And it's a tribute... It's a tribute to the fact that the man who has been our Member of Parliament for the last 25 years, despite the fact that he has been, despite the fact that he has also been the leader of the party and prime minister for the last 11, has still managed to have a tremendous amount of affection held by the constituents of Heighton. I, I don't intend to make a long speech. I know my mum is watching and she told me not to go on too long. I simply want to say on behalf of the constituency, that I am grateful for all the work that has been done in the last three weeks and indeed since February. I want also, before introducing Harold, to pay a tribute to the people who we may tend to forget in the euphoria of victory. And that's the people in the constituencies where they never enjoy the delight of a Labour victory. The people such as those in Crosby where I fought in February On whom, on whom this movement depends. Ladies and gentlemen, it's with the very greatest pleasure as I introduce to you yet again our Member of Parliament and England's Prime Minister, Harold Wilson. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Mayor, Arthur, Secretary of this club and friends. Before I go on, I'm going to ask the photographers now to move to each side. They're all hard-working chaps and members of their union, I know. But they've had a very good show over the last three weeks. And today, they've taken 97 pictures each per hour of me today, including some very good pictures. I bet they won't get printed. 
So I now want to be able to see my constituents. So would you please move a little further I each side? In any case, in any case, apart from telling... I'm quite good in profile, actually. This side's the best, I'm told. But apart from the evening papers, you've all missed your deadlines. You really have, you know. And uh, so I really want to be able to see my constituents who have worked so hard for this victory. Now, the first thing I want to say is to join you, Mr. Chairman, in paying tribute to Arthur Smith. But he is so modest that he, <laughs> that he knows he couldn't have won this great victory in Heighton without you. Now, this is my 10th election campaign. They've all been... It's uh, my 10th, yes. Uh, uh, they've all been victorious. The first one in Heighton was with an 834 majority. But they've all been victorious. It's my ninth campaign here in Heighton. And in the last five campaigns, when I've been leading the party, I am the first to recognize I haven't spent as much time in Heighton as I would have wished. And that means the burden has had to be carried by Arthur, my agent, and by all of you. And I want to pay tribute to you for what you've done. It is a remarkable result in Heighton. Unfortunately, I had to leave uh, the uh, place where I was watching it on television w uh, before I had chance to see an analysis of Heighton, uh, the Heighton result. There's been a very big swing to Labour in Heighton in this election, a very big swing to Labour, and we had a remarkable one in February because we'd lost Kirby. And we had a much bigger majority than I might have expected. But on a lower poll, we have had... On a lower poll, we have had, we've practically maintained our vote. What was it, Arthur? We lost 16 votes. You might inquire into them, would you? <laughs> and I think our swing in height, and I haven't seen the calculations, and I will stand corrected if I'm wrong, but I think it's probably one of the biggest swings in the north of England, here in Heighton. I claim no credit. I give the credit to Arthur, I give it to Francis, I give it to you, Mr. Chairman, your fellow officers, and to everyone here. Where's Francis? He's down there. Look out, <laughs> I'm not going to comment on the national result, except I'll just say this. In my concluding election speeches and my final... Uh, election broadcast, I said, don't let them talk you out of it. And you haven't. They tried. My God, they tried. <laughs> and I think there are results. There are still recounts going on in certain constituencies. We just managed to avoid it here. But the final result is still in doubt. It is still problematical. But I think, and I, I won't uh, myself uh, venture a prediction, I will base myself on the swingometer of the BBC. <laughs> which has bo been moving somewhat erratically tonight, and that was not the fault of the BBC. And... Uh, <laughs> the similar contraption in the possession of ITN. I base myself on them, that whatever happens in the remaining votes, and there are still some difficult results to come from Scotland, possibly, where the Conservatives have lost a seat to the Scotnats. Uh, whatever may happen, the Tories can't take it away from us now. And I can go back and concentrate not on electoral questions, 
still less on the future of the Conservative Party, but on the grave issues facing the country. In 1865, as some of our oldest members here may recall, <laughs> you don't need to identify yourself. In 1865, uh, Hyton was part of a constituency called Southwest Lancashire. Uh, Mr. William Ewart Gladstone. Uh, in those days, you could fight as many constituencies as you wanted. Now it's only done by rather strange, eccentric millionaires. But he fought Oxford, which he lost. I'm happy to say that tonight we gained Oxford. But it didn't matter because, because he was elected for South West Lancashire. He was Member of Parliament for Highton. Now, he went on in the fullness of time to form four administrations. And it would be a very odd turn up for the book tonight with the later results if I shall not be forming my fourth administration tomorrow. So I'm glad... <laughs> So I am glad to feel that two members of parliament for this area, there was no Labour Club in those days, uh, share the record amongst all prime ministers of forming four administrations. Except he formed his first uh, when he was older than I am in forming my fourth. <laughs> I come back now to where I began. I want to thank all of you for your tolerance and uh, friendship and comradeship and your understanding of my problems in that I've got to go all over the country, especially at an election, and to know that you are firmly holding this fort, not merely holding the fort, but extending our gains, and that is what you have done. And the same is true, of course, between elections. I have to go all over the country. I hope to be able to spend a little more time in Heighton uh, in the uh, next uh, administration. Because in the last seven months, once it became clear, and this election started on the 4th of March when the Tories found they were out of office, and they never let up. In the last six or seven months, I was asked to go all over the country. I think now there might be a little stability in our affairs so that we can con concentrate on other matters. And I can concentrate not only on other matters, but also on spending a little more time here in Heighton. Arthur's been very understanding, you've been understanding. I'm not going to trespass on that understanding much longer. I'm going to be here more. And I look forward to being here in this club and elsewhere. I can see, just standing up, the one or two people here tonight who might find it difficult to stand up, but I can see standing up comrades who fought these battles with me since 1950, when our majority was 834. Yes, I can see you there, and others there you are. And as, and as active as ever in this campaign, as in 1950. <laughs> Our people do not age. They go on fighting. I want to thank you for your understanding. Hey? Oh, we don't want any more heckling, do we? I'm not going to tell you how old they are, no. It's 25 years ago now, and they're looking younger every day. But thank you again for your understanding. Thank you again for the tremendous job you've done in this election. You've sent out a signal from Heighton to the whole country, and I believe the country is following. I thank you. Mr. Wilson among his friends at the Heighton Social Club. Now, while Mr. Wilson was talking and uh, thanking his supporters for the support they had given him, one or two interesting things were taking place. First, it became fairly clear that the Scottish Nationalists are not doing well against Labour in Scotland, but doing pretty well against the Conservatives in Scotland. 
Perth and East Perthshire has gone following South Angus to the Scottish National Party. There is a recount in a Labour seat, Stirlingshire West, where Mrs. Jeanette Jones of the SNP must ha be in with some kind of a chance. But Stirling, Falkirk and Grangemouth has stayed Labour, as had been expected. And so I think this does begin to firm up quite seriously Labour's prospect of at least a slim overall majority. Bob? Well, just one back reference to Mr. Wilson, who perfectly fairly compared himself to Gladstone. I remarked earlier that he now will have passed, if he forms an administration and rules for a parliament, he will have passed all other p uh, prime ministers in the 20th century, and his rivals will be merely Gladstone and Salisbury in the late 19th century. Uh, uh, now, let's look at the state of the parties, because we've reached the magic figure in the top right-hand corner that I mentioned at the beginning of the evening. That is a net gain, a change in Labour's favour of 17. Uh, that's what they need for a simple overall majority in the House. Now, it could go higher, or it could, of course, slip back. There's nothing final about it, but there is a kind of symbolic significance, I think, to the fact that Labour has got the 17 net gains they needed, and the Tories equally losing the same number, and the single, sing, single case uh, further down, we talked about the Liberals and uh, the fate of Dick Tavern and so on. That's the picture now. Remember, on the basis of a popular vote, that is presently running at 43% for Labour, and on present predictions will fall to 42 or 41%, which creates some problems for them in terms of a national mandate. It also creates problems if they end up with a majority of less than 10. I think perhaps 10 is the magic figure, because if you're under 10, then you constantly are looking at by-elections and all the rest. So that in terms of stable government, from their own point of view, they obviously want to get into double figures and nearer 20 than 10. Well, Mr. Wilson has missed a seat at Brentford and Isleworth, which has been held by Barney Hayhoe for the Conservatives. Equally, Mr. Wilson has talked in the course of the evening about how uh, dissimilar the uh, small parties are and how even if he lost an overall majority, he might be able still to continue with Labour's full programme. Clyde Cymru, the Welsh Nationalists, have held on in Carnarvon as well as in Merioneth, so they will also be back at Westminster after this election. Now for your definitive prediction, perhaps, Graham? Well, the uncertainty is definitely narrowing. We've got the Conservatives up to 260 mm. at least. We think the Liberals and other parties are going to get about 37 seats, which leaves a very small gap. But most important, the significant fact is we're almost certain now that Labour will get 318 seats. So we think almost certainly they will get an overall majority. Equally, we think it will be less than 10. So uh, that is uh, perhaps uh, a victory. Uh, it may be the sort of majority that Mr. Wilson wants. It may not be, and uh, only time can tell. Now, Robin Day is talking to Mr. William Whitelaw. Good morning, good morning, Mr. Whitelaw. Good morning. Um, Mr. Wilson, uh, the other mo the moment ago, uh, reflecting on what the television was showing, said, whatever happens, the Tories can't take it away from Labour now. Do you accept that? Well, I think we've got to wait and see the results. Uh, obviously, uh, you know me very well. I'm a human person. And if I'm human, well, of course, I'm a little disappointed at what's happened. But we haven't finished yet. A lot of things happen on the Friday. And I would want to see exactly what has happened at the end of the day before I would make any predictions of that sort. And I think it would be wise to do so. But it looks as if it's going to be much closer, the result, than, than the polls or a lot of people suggested, doesn't it? Yes, indeed. Uh, I don't. Uh, mind seeing the polls a little confounded when the polls have been looking as if they were against one. If the polls are looking for you and they're confounded, poor show. But when the polls are looking uh, bad for you and you can find them, good show. And that's what I feel. But uh, doesn't it, uh, the, doesn't the fact that the, the result may be much closer than we expected suggest that if the Conservatives had fought a slightly more vigorous campaign, they could have won? You know, I, I would personally think uh, that we fought a very good campaign indeed for one simple reason. We did two things. First of all, we told people the truth about what is going to happen in Britain in the months ahead. That will redound to our credit when it is seen that we did tell the truth. What? And the second thing is that we did say to people that we believe this country would need to be united to overcome our problems. I believe, again, we shall be justified as time goes on. And so for me, I simply say, well, very well, I believe we fought the right campaign because we told the truth. And if you tell the truth in politics, in the end, you are vindicated, and that is good. Do you think... Uh 
Mr. Heath will survive as leader after this result? Or do you think people will say he fought a much better campaign than they thought he was? I think that all of us are in it together. I think that Ted Heath fought a very good campaign because, above everything else, he showed what a great many people know to be a fact, that he is an absolutely honest and straightforward man who will tell the British people what he believes to be the facts. He did that, and as the facts come out, as it's all seen, people will say, yes, my word, he did tell us what was the truth. Let me draw your attention, Mr. Whitelaw, to the result in Perth and East Perthshire, where a Conservative majority of 8,900 was turned into a Scottish national majority of 793. Now, that's not the pattern everywhere, but doesn't it seem that the Conservatives blundered in not making a more generous offer of home rule than the one they did in their half, rather what was regarded as a rather half-baked offer of a non-elected assembly? Well, I would say so. As you probably know, I am, in fact, a Scotsman myself, although I am seeking still, and we shall have to wait to see how we get on. You play but golf there sometimes, don't I you? am seeking uh, re-election for an English constituency, and we'll see how we get on tomorrow. Uh, but. What I would say is this, I still believe that the people of Scotland realise that they don't want to be divided from the rest of the United Kingdom. I think they would make a terrible mistake if they did, and I believe that in the end they will realise this too. I've heard this particular result. I don't think it had anything to do uh, with particular policies were put forward. I believe it's a, an emotional reaction, which as a Scotsman I understand, but naturally regret. And your final word, Mr. Whitelaw, you still don't concede the election? Oh, certainly not. It is, anyway, it wouldn't be for me to either uh, get, claim the election or concede it. No. Nope. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, naturally I come back to my position. I am humanly, obviously, uh, disappointed as to what has happened, but certainly not in any way downhearted. And I want to see what is going to be the result at the end of the day. That's what's important, and that's what we must all wait for. Thank you for talking to us, Mr. Whitelaw. Alistair? Uh, slightly disconcerting news for Mr. Whitelaw while he was talking to us. There is a recount now in Dumbartonshire East, which is a Conservative held seat, Barry Henderson, and that might be that he was in trouble in Scotland. So let's look at how Labour has been picking up some seats nearer to London than Dumbartonshire East. Here is Hemel Hempstead. Very low swing, but enough to change hands from a hundred odd majority one way to five hundred majority the other way. Liberal vote dropped seven percent, evenly split between the other parties. Mr. Corbett is a journalist. And now we have the uh, Scottish uh, national game here, which we saw very briefly with Perth and East Persia. And here, uh, Mr. Ian MacArthur, who's been the MP since 1959 has been evicted. Douglas Crawford, he's only 33, he's an economic and development consultant and a Cambridge graduate. 14% jump in the SNP vote there. So now let's look at some of the Welsh seats and there may still be some fun to come from Wales. Here's Cardiff Northeast and uh, there's Mr. Roberts back for the Conservatives, Cardiff Southeast, Mr. Jim Callaghan and Cardiff West, Mr. George Thomas, former Secretary for Wales. And more Welsh seats, Mr. Ian Grist in Cardiff North, in Conway, Mr. Roberts, who's a television, a former television executive, and in Flint East, Mr. Jones. A much Jones lower swing University. in the north of, north of Wales and in the south, a rather high swing throughout Cardiff to Labour. Last time, Wales swung slightly to the Conservatives against the national tide, or against the UK tide. And in Cardigan, the Liberal, Mr. Geraint Howells in Swansea East, uh, expected Labour result and in Swansea West, which has been Conservative uh, within historical memory, but safely Labour this time. No movement in Cardigan between Liberal and Labour. Labour, Labour. Liberal majority just unchanged. And in Anglesey, that's Clairdwin Hughes. He's a former Secretary for Wales and former Minister of Agriculture. In Merthyr Tidville, Mr. Rowlands and Mary Onneth, that is Davith Thomas, the Plaid Cymru. I think the Anglesey and Mary Onneth results deserve some note. In Anglesey, right against the tide, there was a 4% jump 
in the Liberal vote. In Merionis, there was a big increase in the Plaid Cymru vote, and we've also heard that Carnarvon has been won, which must give them great hopes of Gwynville Evans winning Carmarthen, which will be one Labour seat lost in this very delicate final. Well, uh, there were only three votes in it last time, David. Let's go to Carmarthen and see how they're taking it. Taking it, they're taking it very uh, feverishly, excitedly, and they're taking it with song uh, here in Carmarthen because uh, this is a five-seat contest, Labour, Conservative, Plaid Cymru, Liberal, and the British Party. And the point is, uh, as just been said, last February, Labour and Plaid Cymru, there were just three votes apart with just over 17,000 each. Gwynoro Jones, the, uh, the holder for Labour, a young career politician who won the seat in 1970, and really the other front-runner, Gwynvor Evans, the first Plaid Cymru MP ever who won this seat at a by-election in 1966 and then lost it four years later. There's a young Liberal here, and uh, the theory that is buzzing in this crowd in Carmarthen is that uh, a lot of votes have gone away from the Liberal this evening, and the feeling seems to be that they have gone in the direction of Plaid Cymru and in the direction of Mr Gwynvor Evans. We shall see shortly the, the declaration expected in about 20 minutes. David Parry Jones at Carmarthen. And, and while we wait for the result in Carmarthen, the other nationalist party, the Scottish National Party, has taken Galloway from the Conservatives. There's also bad news for the Conservatives at Litchfield and Tamworth. There is a recount there, so Major General Jack Goldsmith may be holding on. But uh, we have uh, news, as I say, there of the Scottish Nationalists taking Galloway, but they're taking these seats at the Conservatives' expense, not at the Labour Party's expense, and so not prejudicing Mr Wilson's overall majority, which he still holds to at the moment. Good news for the Communists in Dumbartonshire Central, where Mr Jimmy Reid seems to put up the vote to over 20%, one of the best Communist results in this country for a long day. He's doubled his vote from 14% to 29%, got second place. This is a very impressive thing. It reminds one of Jimmy Callagher making his breakthrough in West Fife to become the first uh, communist MP. If I may, I think it's worth summing up the situation now. Most of the marginal seats between Conservative and Labour are still to come, are counting tomorrow, and the ones that we're still watching for, we know that there are recounts in. Croydon Central, Litchfield and Tamworth, Plymouth Drake, which must be under 50 votes. They've had four recounts there. That comes they're waiting, tomorrow now, they're waiting till tomorrow. And Dumbarton East, where we know there's a recount. The only other ones that could change hands, I think, are Aberdeen South and Brecon and Radnor. Tomorrow we wait for Buckingham, Beeston and Bosworth. And if the Conservatives are to gain any seats, West Gloucestershire and Chorley are the only ones still to come. There are seats that are at stake between the Nationalists and others, which we're still waiting for, like Carmarthen, and there are one or two Liberal seats that are at stake tomorrow. But we are down to about 15 seats, leaving out all the Ulster seats, which uh, may have their problems, that can affect the final outcome. Well, now at this uh, time, just coming up to 3 o'clock in the morning, this seems the appropriate time to say that from the evidence in so far, from the results declared, our prediction for the result of this election is that Labour will have 321, Conservatives 276, Liberals 11, and others, Nationalists and Northern Ireland seats, 27. Remember, Elsie, that is still just a... Uh, Bob, you were saying about that prediction now that we just gave. Well, it's important to note that that's a three, a really a six overall majority. 318 is required for a majority. 321 prediction suggests, therefore, a six-seat overall majority. Then you must allow for perhaps SDLP, one or two others who vote with Labour. But it's very, very near the ten-seat majority situation, which, which is precarious, granted the economic difficulties of the country and the drastic action which the incoming government will have to take. You might be able to pump that up a little bit. I mean, I think the Welsh Nationalists, for example, have voted pretty consistently with the Labour Party. Uh, that's another two that Mr Wilson could uh, bank on. And again, I would have thought that uh, the Scottish Nationalists here uh, probably have some basis of an arrangement with Labour to a certain extent. They've made their seats at the Conservatives' expense. Now the Scottish Nationalists must pause before they go ahead and try to tackle Labour's own strongholds. The thing about narrow majority is it puts power in the hands of small groups within the majority. And, for example, the pro-Europeans in the Labour Party are put in a very much stronger position uh, as against uh, uh, the uh, left wing of the Labour Party, who are um, pro-Europeans are mostly on the right, it does make a great deal of difference to the politics of the next few years that it, Mr Wilson will be governing with a majority but a narrow one. I think it's time that we had a look now at the politics of the South East and it's time again for Sue.
Well, it's quite remarkable over here, Alistair, how few seats are changing hands. Taking a look at our totals for the GLC area, 51 Labour now declared that one Labour gain, 33 Conservatives declared. And you can see here in the Conservative territory, all these seats were at risk slightly, up to 5%, but in fact they've all been kept, including just recent result in Sir George Young back in Acton there. He got in for the first time in February, only been in six months. He's got a slightly reduced majority from 1,451 down to 608. Barney Hayhoe, too, also a very popular local MP, has just managed to cling on. He's got a reduced majority from 726 down to a very tiny 232, but he's still there. Just this one Labour gain here, Tom Ironmonger, who failed to hold that marginal there. Moving over now to our home counties, here again, Labour 13, that's four gains there, Conservatives 33. So quite obviously, our pointer has moved right over this way. The only result we're waiting for here now is Braintree, which should be in within the next half hour or so. Anthony Newton there defending that seat against Keith Kyle. Here in Hemel Hempstead, that's James Allison has been defeated by Robin Corbett. That, in fact, was the smallest majority in the South East. And I think that was a Conservative majority of 187, and it's still, in fact, the smallest Labour majority now in the South East, a tiny majority of 485. Finally, let's have a look at some of the good constituency MPs who've fought hard for local interests and been duly returned to Parliament. Sir Bernard Brain, the Conservative for South East Essex, who organised the opposition to the plans to put Maplin Airport in his constituency and has led the resistance to attempts to build further oil refiners for Canvey Island. George Cunningham is back as Labour MP for Islington South and Finsbury. He's fought consistently for tenants' rights in his area. His wife also stood unsuccessfully as Labour candidate for Twickenham. John Biggs Davison, a good constituency MP again back in Epping Forest, better known as chairman of the Right Wing Monday Club, of course. Ivor Clementson, a former Church of England priest and industrial chaplain in the Luton area who gave up the church for politics. He fought very hard to defend the victims of the court line collapse, of course, uh, both holidaymakers and employers who were affected in his area. Besides beating the Conservatives, Arthur Clementson uh, beat, of course, Arthur Johnston, but Mr. Clementson was also the victor over one Louis Byrne, who stood by mistake as a property development candidate. In fact, he meant to be standing as an Irish civil rights candidate, and he put his occupation down as a builder when he should have put what party he was standing for. I think another one there for the collection of Irish jokes that we have at the moment. Alistair, back to you. Uh, now, let's have a look at some of these London results. Douglas Jay in Battersea North, in Mercado, in Bethnal Green and Bow, and Reg Friesen in Brent East, all safely back for we Labour. We did say there was a recount in Brent East. I don't know why. It must have been might the Liberal deposit, but it caused unnecessary anxiety to some people, perhaps. In Brent South, Laurie Pavitt back, in Brentford and Isleworth, Barney Hayhoe holding on to that uh, marginal, and Robert Carr and Carr Sholton pretty safe. The Brentford result is worth attention. Here was a seat that w might well have been expected to go. It was a few hundred, majority 600, down to 200. And Labour now, as we can see, have 284 seats and they have a net gain of 17. The Conservatives, 175 seats, with a net loss of 18. The Liberals have five seats in their column declared, a net loss of one, and the others have gained two. Now, this includes Scottish nationalist gains from Conservatives, and Brent North, that we just heard, has been held by the Conservatives. Yeah, and twice. let's have a word now from Croydon. We're having a second recount at Central. Let's go to Croydon. And we are on our second recount here, on our second recount now here, Alistair. The first one was a very, very close one indeed. And now a second one has been asked for. The, uh, the difference between the two leading parties, it's the Conservative and the Labour, I suspect, is very, very close. But there also appears to be a number of votes that can't quite be accounted for. Some votes have come in, but, not all, but when, they count, when they've done the total number of counts, some have fallen short and they're now trying to find out why this is so and where it may have happened. So now we're in for our second recount, and it could be about another 20 minutes or so before we find out what the result from this very key marginal seat is going to be. Christopher Rainbow, Croydon Central. And I think Chris is going to have a long night uh, like the rest of us. 
Now let's look at uh, what's made it worthwhile so far for the Labour Party and for Mr. Wilson. Lincoln, which uh, came to him from Mr. Dick Tavern, Labour recovering its own in a sense. Nelson and Cohn, Rossendale, Oxford, Rochester and Chatham, Southampton Test, Ipswich, Bolton West, Ilford North, Peterborough, Bristol North West, Birmingham Selly Oak and Leicester South. Wellin and Hatfield, Berry and Ratcliffe, Hemel Hempstead, and Berwick and East Lothian, one which has just gone, John Mackintosh, being returned there. And the Earl of Ancrum, Michael Ancrum as he was called, elected in February, out evicted in October. And now what the Conservatives have to look at, they have Hazel Grove, which they've taken from the Liberal Dr. Michael with Stanley. And uh, we will not put forward any lists suggesting that there have been at least so far any liberal gains. The people who have gained seats other than Labour and that one for the Conservatives have been so far the Scottish Nationalists. Eddie Milne was returned and Eddie Griffiths in Brightside, the other Labour rebel, was defeated in Sheffield Brightside. So there is still one independent up there in the northeast coast and Mr Milne has made his campaign hold good. He wants, of course, uh, an inquiry into corruption in the northeast. There's one general point about these results that is rather striking. The overall swing is 2.2% to the, to the Labour Party, but in marginal seats it's only about 1.3. The Labour Party was really rather lucky with the electoral system last time, getting more seats with fewer votes than the Conservatives. They can complain that they've been a little unlucky this time, in that the gain in votes they've got has not come in the places fully enough in the places where it matters. Now, David, looking over the whole course of the election so far, uh, there's a very good point, I think, that's been made, that the, it means that the moderates in the Labour Party are perhaps going to have a bigger say than they have had. If, if indeed the crisis that we face as a country is as great as Mr. Wilson suggested it was in his speech at Heighton. I'm sure that is true. Mr. Wilson will be worrying about appealing to ordinary moderate votes in the mass of the electorate, 58% uh, at least, 59% of whom have voted for other parties than his own. And people on the moderate wing can say this. Somebody said to me, there are five or six people left in the Parliamentary Labour Party who have a sort of kamikaze spirit, a suicide urge on the common market, who would not go along, possibly, even with a bill to enforce a referendum. That's a conceivable thing. Again, other things, it just will make politics rather fraught. It may be bad for us if we sought uh, the nation wants clear majority rule. It may not be absolutely clear majority rule. But on the other hand, Mr. Wilson certainly is very adequately skilled to hold together this for a long time. It certainly would be a couple of years before by elections eliminated a majority of 10, I would have thought. I'm told, David, that in fact Blythe is still recounting, and I don't think we've had a confirmation of uh, Eddie Milne's return there. Uh, we have indeed had news that West. Lothian has been held by Labour. This, of course, was the seat which has been challenged continuously. I think this must be the sixth or seventh attempt by William Wolfe, who is the effective leader, though not the parliamentary leader, of the Scottish National Party. That must be a personal disappointment to him and to the Scottish Nationalists. Now, let's go to Robin. And, uh, and with me here, I've got three gentlemen from the world of business and economics. Um, Mr. David Basnett, the leader of the General and Municipal Workers Union, Mr. George Bishop, chairman of Booker McConnell, a large international company and for 20 years in the civil service, I think, and Peter Oppenheimer of Christchurch College, Oxford, an economist just back from the <coughs> IMF meeting in Washington. Gentlemen, first of all, from the point of view of the country's immediate economic dangers, which Mr. Lever was talking about very frankly um, about an hour ago, are you glad that it looks as though Labour's overall majority is going to be a small one, or do you think that's going to be a, a difficulty? Well, I, I personally am, am pleased with the result. I, I note, uh, as a representative of the private sector, that three out of five people have not supported the full Labour manifesto. That's interesting because I think with a small majority and with the public support for the private sector, we shall be spared some of the worst features of heavy nationalisation and some other uh, proposals of Mr Wedgwood meant. Why do you think that, uh, that the, if they have got a working majority, though small, this will be any, um, give them any necessity to um, cut out some of their nationalisation proposals? I think they'll be forced to, as any party would in this situation, to look at the real problems, the problems that Mr Harold Lever was emphasising. 
We and do face a difficult situation. Um, David Bassnett, your view on the smallness of, likely smallness of the working majority. I would have preferred a, a larger majority, of course. I, I don't think, on the evidence, the way the Labour Party has acted so far, that it's going to make much difference to the way they act at the moment. Uh, the manifesto is quite clear. Uh, I don't know uh, what Mr. Bishop is talking about in extreme policies, if he's talking about the policies for the regeneration of industry. Uh, rather strangely, a lot of management accept the need for this to get industry moving again in this country. Mr. Bishop, isn't it a fact that a, a number of businessmen and industrialists were hoping for just this result? Uh, even though they might be conservative people, on the grounds that they felt a Labour government would be able to have the support of a conservative opposition for tough crisis measures in connection with the unions and inflation, whereas a conservative government would be up against a lot of trouble. Yes, I think certainly a number of people thought this would be a good result, a, ba a balanced result. Mm. Well, well I, 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 may I just make a, a yes. comment on that? I think one of the important things in the election is precisely what you've said that the electorate have rejected the confrontation policies of the Tories which they pursued in the last election. Uh, they have sought consensus which the Labour Party is seeking. Well, you say they've sought consensus, you see, but you heard what David Butler was saying. About nearly 40, nearly 60% of the electorate will, uh, will have voted other than for Harold Wilson. In other words, although he's got a working majority, He's got a working majority on about just over 40% of the popular vote. Now, is that a... We know what the electoral system says, but is that really a moral mandate for socialism? This is I the point. I would have thought it is a very clear mandate to act. The population has... Is it a mandate for socialism? It's a mandate to act on the Labour Party manifesto, which I consider a step towards socialism, and there is a clear majority for it. Can I That's our electoral system. Can I bring in Peter Omerheim? <coughs> what do you think about this uh, situation now? You've been in Washington. You heard what Mr. Lever was saying, that the difficulties were now immense, and whatever a Labour government could do on the domestic field, even however successful it might be with the social contract, everything depends, our standard of living, on international problems relating to oil particularly. Right, and I think on this, in this respect, uh, our friends abroad feel, as I personally feel, that this government, and after all we're going to have continuity of government now, is a little bit too inclined to pursue a high-risk strategy rather than a low-risk strategy. By that I mean they're inclined to reflate demand, to put a bit more rather than a bit less in the consumer's pocket, and to count their chickens like mad on North Sea oil. I would have thought it was desirable to keep the lid on, and by that I don't mean to exclude selective reflation of demand. For example, it's obvious that industry needs help, price controls have got to be relaxed, corporation tax has almost certainly got to be cut, but I think it would be undesirable to have any move towards any kind of spending, increased spending by the British consumer. Are you saying that Dennis Healy would be wrong to take action in November which would restrain the rise in unemployment? Um, yes, roughly. I think he should change the balance within the total amount of demand there is at present. The pressure on companies must be reduced. You must try and limit the fall in investment. But insofar as we think that investment will behave better, consumption should be damped more so that nothing net should be done to dampen the rise in unemployment at this stage. David Bassnett? No, I don't agree with that at all. The, the problem is not an overall problem. I agree with Robert, what Robert Oppenheimer says about selective action. I think you need selective action to achieve two things. One, to avoid unemployment where it is occurring in certain industries at the moment. For instance, the building material industry is, a, is an example. And I think it would be very dangerous to allow this unemployment to grow in these industries. I think it should be said there are other industries which have shortage of labour at the moment, but they must take selective action in these industries. Could, could I make I, one I, quick... But, well, may I finish mm, first? Sure. Uh, I think also they have to take selective action in industries to promote exports. That's uh, a necessity at the moment. Peter, not Robert Oppenheimer. I'm Disting sorry. Distinguished, sorry. Distinguished, I'm sorry. Distinguished, I'm sorry. <laughs> distinguished there you are. <laughs> uh, the point I'd like to make in response to that is that... Um, One's got to be aware, when one agrees on the need for selective action, that the government hasn't got the power to take very finely selective action. It has to wield rather blunt mallets, and therefore it can't try to be too fine. And if it pays too much attention to sectoral problems, it will 
as it so often has in the past, and not only Labour but Conservative governments have been, if anything, more guilty of this than Labour, it will overexpand general demand to uh, a dangerous extent. The fact is, much as we would like to be able to manipulate policy so that every individual group of men is helped to secure jobs all the time, it simply isn't practicable to run policy that one way. La one last point. How far would you go in the direction of the Keith Joseph thesis that we've got to keep the money supply uh, strictly right as the essential for conquering inflation? Oh, I think there's a great deal in that. Um, the precise details of it uh, would vary from circumstance to circumstance, but as a general indicator and as a sort of indicator for a path to be pursued in the medium term, it's a sound one, I but think. But as, as I remember from that program, you don't go all the way with the great I Professor all Friedman. The way. I don't go all the way. I I've go got a lot Mr. Of the way. Bishop, one, one sentence. Could I say the important thing is priorities? Yes. That we've got to beat inflation. We must act, therefore, quickly. We must deal with business liquidity above all. I agree with everything that Peter Hopper and, and I have said. And you have confidence that a Labour government will do this? I think a Labour government will face up to the crisis now the election's over. Alistair? And with these problems facing the Labour government, as it's now clear it's going to be a Labour government here in London, let's look north to the people who think they'd be better off without being governed in London, the Scottish nationalists, and what have they had to please them tonight? So far, only three gains. South Angus, Perth and East Perthshire, and now Galloway, all three from the Conservatives. Here's the result from Galloway, in which we see Mr George Thompson, he's 46, and a teacher taking the seat from a new Conservative, the former Conservative MP, having retired. But a majority of only 30. This is the smallest majority we've had tonight. We've got four or five recounts on, which I think are going to produce majorities under 100. But still, there is Galloway with a majority of 30, the low result for the night. And one of those recounts, of course, in Stirlingshire West. They're on the second recount there, and still SNP hopes must be high. But Bill Miller in Glasgow, what do you think of the SNP hopes yourself now? Well, the SNP are obviously gaining seats from the Conservatives. If you look at the SNP versus Conservative uh, swingometer, you'll find that it's so far working quite perfectly, at least perfectly for the SNP. Uh, Perth and East Perthshire has gone to the SNP. Galloway has gone. Angus South has gone. We won't get the result for Ross and Cromarty until tomorrow, but Dumbarton West is recounting, so obviously it's very close there as well. It rather looks as if all of these five seats will go over from the, national, uh, from the Conservatives to the Nationalists. Labour has won one seat from the Conservatives, Berwick and East Lothian. There is roughly a 4% swing from Labour to Conservative in Labour Conservative marginals, but somehow Teddy Taylor in Cathcart managed to survive and kept that seat for the Conservatives. There's a recount on in Aberdeen South. It looks as if Labour will certainly gain, has gained Berwick and may gain one more seat on uh, that swingometer. Labour, on the other hand, has managed to defend itself very well against the SNP. Dundee East has gone to the SNP, they held it already. But Labour has retained Govan, Stirling Boroughs, West Lothian, Hamilton, Mid Lothian, Dundee West, East Kilbride, all seats which the SNP thought they might get. It now looks as if the SNP are not likely to gain very much from the Labour Party, possibly Stirling West, but even that is doubtful given the other results that we've seen this evening. So the net result in Scotland is likely to be Conservatives either 14 or 15 seats out of the 71, Labour something like 41 or 42 seats out of the 71, SNP up to 12, and the Liberals staying at 3. And of course, 19 years ago, the Conservatives held a majority of seats in Scotland. So that has been really quite a washout for them, and that has been confirmed in this general election. For the rest of the country, Bob McKenzie? Well, it is extraordinary when you st stop to think of it, with now 477 results in, only 21 seats have changed hands. What in effect has happened is that a tiny ripple has gone across the country. 1%, 2% switch across the country, and in the critical areas, the marginals, about 1%. If you look where the seats have changed hands, there's the Scottish picture we just heard from uh, Bill, Bill a moment ago, with Conservatives losing net four, uh, SNP gaining three, Labour gaining one. Uh, some change in the in Northwest, as we indicated here, four Labour gains, and this change for the other parties, and no change at all, say the North or Northeast. I mean, the whole thing remaining as it was. And then you'll see the other changes in East Anglia, in the home counties, Labour gains of four there, 
uh, a one in the West, and so on. The astonishing thing is how near it is to a no-change election, rather than one of spectacular change. In London area, Sue's talked about how little's happened in London and the surrounding territory. Uh, in that sense, I think the news really is that the tiny ripple was enough to give Labour probably a slight overall majority, but not enough to give them anything like the majority you'd have expected had you read your and uh, taken seriously the opinion polls. And let's look at some results, starting in the Midlands. There's Mr. Smith in uh, Warwick and Leamington, the first biographer of Harold Wilson, incidentally, and also Coventry South East, that's not Harold Wilson, that's William Wilson, and in Dudley East, that's Dr. Gilbert, who's Financial Secretary of the Treasury. And some more from the Midlands again, Derbyshire North East, Warley West, and Nottinghamshire North. Mr. Archer in Warley West is the Solicitor General. The swing is slightly above the average in the Midlands. And still in the Midlands, Birmingham Hall Green, Nuneaton and Wally East. Wally East, Andrew Falls, well known as an actor. I think Birmingham has actually shown the biggest overall swing to the Conservatives of any city so far. And uh, now we have Rushcliffe, Dudley West and Meriden. No surprises. And now moving up to the northwest again in Bootle, Chester and Liverpool Wavertree. Again, no surprises. Merseyside's another area which has swung particularly heavily towards Labour. In the northeast, Gateshead West, that's John Horham, in Hartlepools and South Shields. Three Arthur very big East. swings in safe Labour seats in the northeast. Newcastle on Tyne East, Jarrow and Redcar. These are all Labour strongholds. Low swing in Newcastle East. That was once a Conservative seat for one Parliament. And uh, rather brighter for the Conservatives, Julian Amory in Brighton Pavilion. Southampton Itchen, of course, the Labour seat, and Portsmouth South. Mr Bonner Pink. And now in Shipley, Mr Marcus Fox, who you may see on Conservative political broadcasts. Dewsbury, that's David Ginsburg, and Leeds South East. Leeds was another city with a big swing to Labour. And uh, Leeds North West, uh, Sir Donald Cabery, he's uh, a long-time member, Howell Central and Sheffield Attercliffe. Mr Duffy once held the Cone Valley. He was booted out there by Mr Richard Wainwright. And now in the Midlands again, in Nottingham East, Mr Jack Dunnett, Coventry North West, Mr Morris Edelman, Birmingham Erdington, uh, Mr Julius Silverman. And now rise at Northwood, Fulham and Norwood. Uh, no real surprises there. The former Foreign Secretary, Mr Michael Stewart in Fulham. Not so many nutcases standing against him. Now he's stopped being Foreign Secretary. Low swing in Ryslip and outer suburb. And uh, now the Islington seats in full array here. Islington South and Finsbury, Islington Central and Islington North. Higher swings in the centre of London. Uh, Nottingham, Newark and Birmingham Northfield, no surprises. And still in the Midlands, here we have Stoke-on-Trent Central and North and newcastle under Lyme nearby. They didn't poll very heavily in 1970 because they were all on holiday. They've all had a chance this time. Now, here's a serious result coming from Berwick and East Lothian. This is the Labour gain in Scotland. That's John McIntosh, of course, an expert on cabinet government and politics, unseating the Earl of Ancrum, who prefers to be known as Michael Ancrum, in this seat, which has always been marginal. Uh, this is very interesting. A squeeze on the Scottish National Party. They drop by 1% in the share of the vote there because it obviously was a critical Labour Conservative marginal. They must have gone back, I think, probably, to voting for John McIntosh rather than Lord Ancrum. So now, David, uh, we have uh, what? Have we any hopes of any changes tonight that could confirm the situation, well, or do we have to swing we, it down we, no, until we've tomorrow? We've got about six seats we've been told are recounting. Blythe, West Stirling, uh, Lanark, Plymouth Drake, we're waiting until tomorrow, but Litchfield and Tamworth, Croydon Central on its second recount, 
Dumbarton East. So there's a lot to, still to wait for tonight if you're trying to work out what the final result is going to be. And since our computer experts have come to the conclusion at the moment, 322 is the likeliest Labour number. That's only four above the margin. Uh, it is worth waiting because it is fairly critical to the nature of the next few months, uh, next few years, whether Labour comes out of this with, say, a major clear majority of six or a clear majority of 14. One might well last the Parliament out, the other would be rather unlikely to. Although Mr Wilson does seem to believe that uh, he can pick up support among some other of these parties. For example, he's pretty sure of Jerry Fitz's vote from the SDLP. It might be that he could get Ivan Cooper's uh, vote if uh, Mr Cooper also succeeds in Northern Ireland this time. The two Welsh nationalists are pretty strongly pro-Labour. So I think he does doubt if he can be sweated down. No, but I think he is in an awkward position on vote after vote. These people will actually vote against him on issues. Parliament would still be a live place. When the majority is under 10, you do sweat on each vote, and one or two people with consciences can cause a stir, and I'm sure that the nationalists will want to make their weight felt. They won't be lobby fodder for the Labour Party under any circumstances. Well, now, I think there's an interesting point here. Mr Wilson uh, is used, to, uh, indeed accustomed, and rightly so for political purposes, to say that his majority in 1964 worked very well. But, of course, he got into very serious trouble about steel nationalisation when uh, Woodrow Wyatt, for example, and Desmond Donnelly decided that they would dig their heels in. Now, do you think that uh, this is a confirmation that the moderates do well in such a situation? I think the moderates do well, or in fact, in some extent, the ruthless do well. People who are willing, slightly disloyally, to rock the boat have a power to do damage when they rock the boat in a way that they don't uh, when there's a big majority. I think uh, you've got a word, Bobby. Well, I'd like to say that I think it is not a happy result. I, I quite agree that he can govern and govern for perhaps the whole life of a parliament, but I think whichever party was coming into power now needs to take drastic action, whatever they may have said during the campaign, really drastic action, and I think it would be unfortunate if you have a coming and going relationship with minority groups and dependent on them in sort of pinch situations, and therefore even now I think one would hope that uh, the, since Labour is the largest party, it does get at least into two figures in its majority, but at the moment we're talking about an eight majority, which is very near to the 1964 situation, which, while it produced some effective action, in the end, you got dissolution and another election. And I think that would be the one thing that the country doesn't need or want. Well, let's another try election the, within, say, two years. Let's try this out on the practicing politicians now. Robin is talking to Ian Mercado for Labour and John Biggs-Davidson for the Conservatives. Yes, Mr. Biggs-Davidson is the right-wing chairman of the Conservative Monday Club, and Mr. Mercado is the left-wing uh, ex-chairman of the Parliamentary Labour Party. First of all, Mr. Mercado, the BBC being a scrupulously fair organisation, I think I ought to give you an opportunity to reply to an attack made on you earlier in the evening by the Foreign Secretary, Mr. Callaghan, uh, who said that you were the bookmaker who gave the worst odds in the business. Um, I don't think that's right. And I must say, I uh, am very saddened by this grievous split in the party. And I must have words with Jim. Jim was in the first year of the Portsmouth Southern Secondary School for Boys when I was in the fourth year. And he always was a, a rather fractious young cub, and I must deal with him properly now for making such a frightful remark. What's the state of your book now? Oh, well, it's the worst book I've ever had because I've got what no bookmaker ever wants, which is an unbalanced book, because the only people I could get to put money on the Conservatives were the political journalists. Are you getting any... Uh, have you got a new book open now about... about uh, yes, I've got a book open now. I opened it a couple of hours ago on the date when Mr Heath will cease to be leader of the Conservative Party. And what odds have you got on that particular...? The favourite is towards the back end of next year. Next year? Yeah. Oh, not before then? No, if you, if you fancy it's going to be before then, Robin, you can have some handsome odds. Just before we come to Mr Biggs Davison, who I know would like to comment on that, we have to go to Carmarthen. This is the Parliamentary election of Parliament Constituency by Mr John Thomas, the Attorney General. Sidan with Redol. Prosser a tholiad a enwyr i chod. Drwy hyn yn ysbasu, mae cyfanrif y pledleisiau a roddwyd i bob yn gweithydd yn yr etholiad oedd fel a ganlyn. A'i ddiandasain 
been the acting returning officer for the constituency above mentioned, hereby give notice that the total number of votes given for each candidate at the election was as follows. Gwynvo Richard Evans, Tyre Miller Higain, Tree Hunt Dai De Gafim, 23,325. That's the Plaid Cymru vote. Robert Anthony Hayward. Conservative. Dewey Veal, now Kant, Hwe De Gadai, 2,962. Evan Brisbane Jones. This, this is the British Party. Three Kant, Edward De Gadai, 342. Gwynoro Glyndor Jones. The Labour Party candidate. Kedar Miller Bamfeg, Hwe Kant, Uith De Gafim. 19,685. That's not enough. David Roderick Owen Jones. Liberal. Pim Eel, Tree Hunt, now Dega 3. 5,393. At for the persona in Wiri Sod, Wedi Ethel and Reolith, he was an Athian Eilod, Drosser Ethelith and Wed, save Gwynwar Richard Evans. And that's a great success for the grand old man of Plaid Cymru, the president. He's been running the party since 1945. He was MP briefly from July 1966 to 1970. And he must have stood for Parliament at least ten times. And now he's come through. And that's Labour's first loss of the night. A 10%, 11% increase in the Plaid Cymru vote and a 9% drop in the Labour vote. Here are the full result. 86% by 3%, the largest turnout we've had in anywhere to any seat tonight. And Labour losing that seat, David, but they have gained Lichfield and Tamworth. That means that uh, Major Jack Goldsmith is out and Mr Bruce Grocott has got that seat for the Labour Party. But uh, just to return to Carmarthen, this is a, a remarkable personal vindication for Gwynfer Evans. I think it's a very striking result. It is a big increase in the share of the vote, 45%. It means you've got a much larger share of the vote than either of the other two uh, applied Cymru members who returned in Merioneth and in, Carn in Carnarvon. And he failed by only three votes last time. He's got a margin of 3,500 votes this time. And that, of course, is bad luck for Mr Guinoro Jones, who's Parliamentary Private Secretary to Roy Jenkins. I think it's a beautiful example of how turnout is affected by supermarginality. One always finds that when you get a single-figure majority, people do get terribly excited about the election and the turnout goes up. I wonder what we'll see in Bodmin tomorrow morning, oh. where there was the nine-vote majority last time. There probably was some tactical voting there, with both the Conservatives and the Liberal Party losing their deposits. I think it was quite clearly tactical voting there. Uh, as there has been in one or two other seats tonight, we've had absolutely clear evidence. Cone Valley, where the Liberals got back because the Tories decided they'd vote Liberal rather than Labour. One or two other places, but the Labour vote has not been willing to s switch the Liberals to push the Tories out. Uh, news that Bromsgrove and Redditch, uh, which the Conservatives have held, just held now tonight. Of course, that's one that went to Labour uh, in a by-election during the last Parliament. The Conservatives got it back in February. That's not a particular surprise there. There's no other seats that Plaid Cymru have much chance of taking this time, David? No, none at all. I mean, we've, Anglesey was the fourth on their list. The other ones, where they did well, are in the valleys and absolutely the same thing. And now, I think, I think we're getting Gwynfor Evans speaking in English now <laughs> from Carmarthen. But now I think I ought to thank to the, the people of, of Carmarthen for making history once again and for giving a lead to the whole of Wales once again. I think the message that has gone to London will be heard there, and the message is quite a clear one, that Wales now is determined to live as a nation under her own parliament and government. Thank you, people of Carmarthen. Well, of course, one isn't quite clear what the message is that is coming from Wales to London because, as we were just saying a moment ago before Gwynfor Evans spoke, 
Uh, Plaid Cymru has little chance of putting up its number of seats above the three, at least in the foreseeable future. While the Scottish nationalists, who have at least been taking seats in rather sizable quantities from the Conservatives tonight, are making a much bigger impression. And indeed, the very ideas about devolution, which have been put forward by Mr. Wilson so far and his advisers, have of course favoured the Scots rather more than devolution to the Welsh. There's been actually no change in the Plaid Cymru share of votes in Wales as a whole. They have done well in the three seats they held they have not done at all well elsewhere now Robin I think we should return to you yes I, I was talking to mr. Mikado just now mr. Biggs Davison yeah. you were listening and mr. Mikado was saying he's opening a book in his um, uh, amateur capacity as a bookmaker uh, on that mr. Heath would give up the leadership of the Conservative Party fairly soon now leaving aside the bookmaking aspects of this do you see this as a political likelihood or certainty? Well, I haven't been talking to Mr. Heath lately. I've been very busy in my Epping Forest constituency. Uh, I don't know whether he's contemplating giving up or not. But I think it's far... But I would guess that uh, he hasn't uh, taken any such uh, decision at all because, after all, it's very early days. We don't know how this is going to work out. We don't know whether it's going to be uh, an overall Labour majority or what. Uh, and... Um, Although people say, of course, that if a leader is defeated successively, then he's likely to go. It's, it's by no means certain what the out, uh, outcome is going to be all overall. Those, all those comments And so being all these things are completely uh, in the future. While all those things are completely in the future, what do you think yourself the Tory party leads a new leader? I think that the Tory party needs some new people in front, yes. I'm not, going, I'm not going to say... Uh, what the parliamentary party at some future date might decide about their future leader. But I, I think that, quite frankly, one of the troubles about the Conservative Party lately has been that we've been boring in the sense that we haven't had uh, uh, enough people, uh, spokesmen, in front who have caught the imagination of the electorate. Now, this result is much closer than the polls uh, um, seem to predict. Does this not suggest, or may it not suggest to some people, and perhaps to you, that if the Tories had fought a different kind of campaign, you might call it less boring, other people might call it tougher, more aggressive, more vigorous, less of this national unity stuff, they might have won. No, no, when I said uh, boring, I meant uh, the uh, personalities. But um, oh, I you? think that the... It's very easy to uh, recriminate about uh, the conduct of a campaign if it is not as successful as you'd hoped. But I think that the national unity line was right. I think it should have been taken up uh, more consistently, more firmly, and more clearly, because I don't think it was explained enough to the electorate. Ian Mikado, what's your comment on all that? Well, uh, you were asking about the campaign, you mm. know, and whether it uh, reflected credit on Mr Heath. This was my tenth general election, and I found a certain difference between this and all the previous nine. In the past, it's been rather a battle of manifestos, a battle of programmes. Which party could put forward something that most... I had the feeling in this campaign that people were not comparing what the parties were promising. What they were comparing was how far they believed the parties would deliver what they were promising. In other words, it wasn't a battle of manifestos or programmes, it was a battle of credibility. Credibility as to whether Labour could make the social contract work, credibility as to whether the Tories could avoid industrial conflict. With now, the I'm not sure, Robin, whether people made it as specific in their minds as that. You see, I think that the national unity thing, the national government thing, and Mr Heath, was counterproductive because people remembered he was the architect seven months ago, eight months ago, of the greatest division in our society since the general election of 1926. And he didn't sound a credible figure as the architect of national unity. What about that, uh, John? Well, if, if you formed a, a, a national unity government, uh, no doubt you would uh, have uh, different people uh, in it. You might even have to change the conservative leader uh, in a government of national unity which had a conservative majority. This, I, I freely admit, that one of the implications of a government of national unity might well be uh, ch certain changes. Now, will, think, will you, John, will I'm, you... I'm, I'm, I'm with John on this, you see. I think that if the Conservative Party had come forward and said government of national unity, no preconditions about who was going to lead it, 
I think it might have been an extremely effective ploy. But the trouble, what made it incredible was that Mr. Heath said, I'm not telling you who's going to be in it, except that I'm going to be the boss. What about that, John Big Well, this, this is not, not entirely clear, but um, it is certainly the case that when we last had a, gov a national government to deal with a very severe financial and economic crisis, uh, that national government, although it had a conservative majority, had a, uh, a Labour or ex-Labour Prime Minister, and Mr. Baldwin served under him, uh, only afterwards uh, taking charge when Mr. Ramsay MacDonald had retired. Mr. Big Davison, will you and uh, do you think other Conservative members who think like you on, on policy and principles, will you be going back to Westminster hoping or intending to get a change of Conservative leadership? No. Not, that's not my um, first uh, object at all. But uh, there is one, uh, one uh, thing very much in my mind on getting back to Westminster, uh, and that is that we have got to get to terms with the Ulster Unionists. Because, um, <coughs> Does that mean you because, want to see Mr. Powell we, back in the fold? Because it might be that we can prevent uh, Mr. Wilson having an overall majority. <laughs> it's quite absurd, and it's, it's one of the um, reasons, one of the reasons why I opposed uh, my own a party's policy on Northern Ireland was that it resulted in us losing our conservative base in Northern Ireland. A and it's quite absurd that the, the, um, the Ulster Unionists, certainly those Ulster Unionists whose associations are still affiliated with the National Union of Conservatives and Unionist Associations, it's quite absurd that they should be counted separately on the scoreboard. Well, we'll see whether that uh, becomes a reality in the Parliament to come and how much the majority of Labour is. And uh, meanwhile, Alistair, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, just to pick up two results, which we must uh, apologise for, we did correct the Blaby result. That, of course, is Nigel Lawson's seat and was held by the Conservative, not, as we first said, by Labour. We should also now give you the full result from Dumbartonshire Central and with a particular look at the communist result there, Jimmy Reid. We got an exaggerated version of Mr. Reid's share of the poll and as you see, in fact, Hugh McCartney held the seat, Cameron Aiken of the SNP came second and Mr. Jimmy Reid actually lost his deposit. No, we gave actually the communist vote as the SNP one. That was the source of the trouble. In fact, Mr. Reid dropped from 14.6, saving his deposit, down to 8.7% of the vote. Well, I just wonder if I could give a few results now as far as they affect trade unions. But uh, I see we have something up here about the Northeast, uh, none of them particularly interesting, except, of course, Mr. William Rogers there in Stockton, who is the Deputy Defence Minister and, of course, a strong pro-European. Uh, the unions, of course, play a particular part in general elections. We've been doing some research into it, and it was interesting to see Mr. David Bassnett, for example, on the program a short while ago. His general municipal workers have 13 sponsored MPs. Uh, transport and general workers have got 24 MPs back, the engineers, 21 MPs back, and the National Union of Mine Workers, 18 MPs back. Mr. Scannon's had two failures on this. He challenged, or his members challenged the Liberals in Rochdale and failed. Cyril Smith got in there. They also challenged Gordon Wilson in Dundee East and failed there. That was George Machin. The winner of this general election, so far as the unions are concerned, is, of course, Mr. Clive Jenkins. Now, he began having nine MPs elected from his union, as Tim's. He's now gone up to 12, including Sir Edward Brown, of course, the Conservative in Bath. It's been quite a year for Mr. Jenkins. He got on to the General Council of the TUC, and uh, he's also put up his standing, his representation in the House of Commons. Bob? Uh, yes, there's one point to be made on this, you know, that's a bit baffling. In one sense, a source of concern, I think, to Labour. That is, the electorate is roughly two-thirds working class, oh, certainly over 60 percent, and Labour gets 41 to 3 percent of the vote. We don't know where it'll settle down, but if there had been a really spontaneous enthusiasm for the social contract, you would have expected Labour to come back with, in the high 40s or 50s, and this must be a slight source of concern, that there hasn't been this, the evidence of working-class enthusiasm that would be, uh, produce a much bigger Labour majority. Uh, remember, after all, Labour is taking office now with roughly the same support it had when it lost the election of 1970. Well, that's a point when it runs into trouble, of course, isn't it? Yep. Uh, we saw there, just while we were talking, David Knox has held leak for the Conservatives. David Knox is, in fact, uh, the MP who has been put in charge of the 
part of the Conservative youth programme, and so no doubt that is some comfort. That was, well, it was a Labour seat, right from 45 to 70, and it must be a considerable comfort to have him back. I should be very interested to see how big his majority is, because it was one of the seats, the five or six I'd got noted, that we're still waiting for tonight, which can affect things. Indeed, Abbasit Dean South is the only one that we're waiting for, which could change hands, which we don't know there's actually a recount going on in. So we are waiting for these poor people who are going to their second or sometimes their third or fourth recount uh, to find out who is their member. Well, it sometimes feels like we're having a recount here as we come up towards a quarter to four. Nevertheless, we're happy to go on counting for a moment and let's look at some of the counts in the northeast coast. Newcastle upon Tyne West and uh, Gateshead East and Sunderland South, Labour strongholds. And rather big swings right over there in the, in the northeast. Cutting well, across to Merseyside again, there's Eric Heffer back in Liverpool, Walton. In Runcorn, Mark Carlyle, who's a junior minister at the Home Office. We're hoping to have a word uh, with his boss at that time, Mr. Robert Carr, in a moment. And Staley Bridge and Hyde uh, remaining Labour. And moving south now to Dorset South, Evelyn King, of course, a former Labour stalwart, uh, holding Dorset South there. Gosport and uh, Brighton, Kemptown, well, Andrew Bowden back there beating off Mr. Hobden's continuous challenge. And now into London and Streatham and Southall and Lewisham East, uh, no particular uh, worries or changes there. Rather big falls in turnout in all those London seats. And in Watford, Raphael Tuck, of course this has been thought to be a marginal ever since John Freeman used to have it, but uh, he looks pretty safe this time in Spellform, Humphrey Atkins, and uh, down there, Essex southeast, there's Bernard Bray. But again, a notably low swing in Essex. Every Essex swing I've noted has been under 1%, and it is around Dagenham. It may be, you know, it's not as nearly as striking as the West Midlands things in last February, when there was a huge swing in Powell country to uh, the Labour Party. But here, in, around in Essex, we've got the lowest set of swings in any area of the country. Well, now, that's probably, what do you mean by that, that the wives probably are actually voting against the kind of strike that they had at Forts? Well, now, we must wait. And our prediction is still, therefore, of Labour having a small but clear overall majority. And uh, we have some, uh, I think, yes, we have Sue here. She's concealed behind a camera but I can see her. Sue? Well, we thought we'd take a look at this stage of the night, Alistair, at some of the new faces who will be going to Westminster for the first time, the new MPs for London and the South East. There is, of course, first of all, Helene Middleweek, the glamorous 25-year-old Labour MP for Wellen and Hatfield. Miss Middleweek, who got married during her campaign against Lord Balneal, was the second woman president of the Cambridge Union. In the February election, she fought Enoch Powell's old seat of Wolverhampton and, in fact, got his personal vote. And then, of course, there's Robert Bean, who ousted Price's peg, Mrs. Fenner, from Rochester and Chatham. Age 39, he's a thoroughly local man, locally educated and a Chatham councillor. This is his third go at getting into Parliament. He's previously fought, unsuccessfully, Gillingham and Thanet East. It was third time lucky also for Australian-born Robin Corbett, aged 41, a political journalist who is now the new MP for Hemel Hempstead. And in Christopher Mayhew's old seat of Woolwich East, there's John Cartwright, who at the age of 41, I'm told, is an ardent fan of Charlton Athletic. He's a member of Labour's National Executive and unsuccessfully content contended Bexley Heath in 1970 and last time. And finally, the new MP for Ilford North is Mrs Millie Miller, a 51-year-old social worker, a woman who's obviously used to being seen in the public eye. She's been mayor of both Stoke, Stoke Newington and Camden. Well, now to uh, recap on the situation in London and the South East, we've got 51 Labour results in the GLC and 34 Labour, that's including the one, for, I'm sorry, 34 Conservative, that's including the one Labour gain. And in the South East, we've got 13 Labour seats, 34 Conservative seats, and that's four Labour gains over the Conservatives. In fact, there's been a strong swing to Labour in the capital, in the GLC area itself, which is only just below the national average. But it was mostly in their own strongholds, as we saw on the map. So, in fact, they failed to regain the marginals that they might have hoped to have done. They only got the one, you remember, which was, of course, Ilford North, where Millie Miller got it from Tom Ironmonger. 
In the home counties, the swing to Labour was 1.3%, but in South East Essex, it was down to as little as 0.3%. That's the constituency with the largest number of owner-occupiers in the country, so perhaps Margaret Thatcher's promises actually had their desired effect there. And of course, it was a bad night for third parties in the South East. The Liberals, who so successfully squeezed the Labour vote last time, were in this election successfully, or rather for them, unsuccessfully squeezed themselves. And of course, the National Front, which fielded half of its total number of 91 candidates in the South East. I think we had 47 of them altogether has done as badly as it did in February. That's all from us for now. Alistair, back to you. And I think Bob McKenzie has got a thought about uh, why the election ended this way. Well, I really wanted to come back to the discussion about Mr Heath's prospects. It seems to me you can look at it two ways. The Tories have done far better than most commentators expected. Now, you can say this, again, proves the undoubted virtues of Mr. Heath as a campaigner. But equally, some are bound to say, and I think they could make a case for this, that had they changed leader, say, during July, and a fresh figure had taken over, without all the difficulty of having to explain February and the three-day week, the Tories on these figures might just have squeaked through into victory. Well, now, who would have been this uh, figure that would have saved the Tories? Well, I mean, Mr. Whitelaw was the one who was most widely quoted, and I'm not now assessing anybody else's virtues, except that Mr. Heath now has had four contests with Mr. Wilson and lost three. But don't you think Mr. Wilson would have made mincemeat of a new figure? He would have asked, why was the leader changed? Uh, the, the Tory party has changed its leaders historically whenever they lose uh, several times. Well, Mr. Heath didn't win in 1966, mm. so they dropped Sir Alec. Well, uh, they dropped Sir Alec after he'd lost. Yes, but then they yeah. had a new leader, Mr. No, Heath, and he... No, he, he I'm, no, no, I'm not speaking. now saying they change every time. I'm simply saying that on the record, the Tory party has cashiered leaders once they fail a number of times. And I'm saying it could be argued two ways, whether Mr. Heath is more vulnerable or less vulnerable as a result of this fascinating result. I must say on this that I encountered a local Tory, not a great person in the party, who said, I think on Wednesday, Thursday, I may be saying, I'm paying the price of my loyalty and other people like me. We didn't make a fuss about the leadership because we thought there might be another election last March. If we had made a fuss, perhaps it would have been different. Now, I would argue possibly against that as an actual practical interpretation of what might have happened after a change of leader, but that sort of thought is certainly going through people's minds. I'm sure it must be going through people's minds, but I'm sure that one of the other thoughts that must be going through the minds of the Conservatives in the House of Commons is the ability of the replacement. Mm. Now, Mr Heath is, I think, by common consent, uh, a man who dominated his cabinet, rightly or wrongly. He seems to, in many ways to be intellectually head and shoulders over a number but of you the people who are that, named. But he uh, runs behind his, his, his party. Successes. Every time the public is asked, he's the least popular figure uh, to lead the party. Now, in the real world, politicians have to take this into account, I think, and just on that evidence alone, and after all, how many chances to be defeated do you have to be given as a party leader? In most countries, if you're defeated three out of four times, that's it. Well, it may well be it for Mr. Heath mm. now, but I think, Bob, it's all very well saying that. Uh, in the old days in the Tory party, the leader had to emerge, and it required some consensus, some working out in order to find it now. Conservatives now actually have an elected leader. It's the first elected leader they've had. Uh, presumably, if uh, Mr. Heath were to make this move, he would have to announce to the party or to the right officers in the party that there was going to be an election. Now, he might stand for re-election. What would happen then? You yep. can't beat somebody with nobody, and you've got to have somebody willing to stand against him. And the interesting thing is that the most obvious possible successor, Mr. Whitelaw, is a man of great loyalty who would certainly, I think, have to be pushed into the ring. He wouldn't actually do the death blow to the man with whom he has been extremely closely associated. Uh, David, you wrote in your book in the 1970 election that on the Sunday before the Thursday of that election, leading figures in the Tory party met to discuss what they would do with Mr. Heath when he lost that election. Yes. And now, so therefore, that meeting may have been taking pl taking place last Sunday again. It well, may have taken place. That, but... that I'm sure is pure <laughs> hypothesis, uh, Bob. And I think we ought now to go to Robin, who is in position to talk to Robert Carr. Well, just before just before I talk to Mr. Carr, listening patiently to those uh, those uh, that heated argument among our experts, may I say that perhaps all three of you may have underestimated Mr. Heath's powers of survival, because there is a very narrow majority. And before the weeks are out, it may well be that people say that Mr. Heath, for all his shortcomings, which are constantly referred to, may well be the best man. Now, am I right or wrong in that suggestion, Mr. Carr? Well, all I can say is I can't imagine anybody who could have fought a better campaign in the circumstances. Mr. Heath, 
and I hope all his colleagues, have told the country what we believe to be the truth about this country's economic plight. Mr. Wilson and Mr. Healy and their colleagues have chosen to present to the country a much softer picture and the country have for the moment believed it. I still think our picture will prove to be right. But don't you and think... And I think in the end the truth will out and I can only say that um, I, I can't imagine anybody whom I would wish rather to have followed than Mr. Heath in this campaign. Do you make that a reference to the future as well as to the past? I certainly have no wish to make any change or have any part in any change. Um, do you think, though, uh, Mr. Carr, and this may apply to you as well as Mr. Mr. Heath, mm. do you think that if the Conservatives have fought a slightly different campaign, less muted, less emphasis on national unity and more attack on Labour, as they did last time, that they might have won because well, of... this is a hypothetical question. Of I course. Believe I believe we fought the right campaign. I've lived in three great crises in my life, the crisis of 31, the crisis of the war, and this great crisis. In the first two, we found it right in the end for a limited period to have a coalition government. I believe that was right now, there, and for now, I believe it still is right now. I think we were right to put this for the country. I think we were right to tell the country how desperately serious the situation is. Mr. Carr, and I would rather lose, frankly, telling the truth than win by not telling it. Well, you've, do you've done so. But um, uh, don't you think that Sir Keith Joseph's observations on the economy and his criticism of, of the Tories' industrial relations at the last election and so on uh, have been damaging to the Conservative case? and embarrassing to you as Shadow Chancellor? No, I haven't found them that. I, I think on the whole, most people in this country would like to see us arguing these problems honestly. There is a difference of emphasis between Keith Joseph and me, not a difference in basic analysis. Uh, of course, I mean, Keith Joseph didn't in fact say the things that some people said he said. Uh, 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 and, and I mean, I'm, I, I certainly don't believe, but nor does Keith Joseph, that you can solve our problems of inflation by the application of monetary means alone. Thank you, Mr. Carr. I'd like to pursue it, but I must leave Thank at this you moment. Very much. Goodbye. And simply to say that Lanark has stayed Labour, Mrs. Judith Hart is back there. So that's one more for Mr. Wilson. Labour now have 292 seats, a net gain of 17. Conservatives, 183, a net loss of 19. Liberals, five seats, a net loss of one. And the others have gained three, although, of course, there is a loss in there, Mr. Dick Tavern, the seats coming to Plaid Cymru, who picked up one, and the Scottish Nationalists, who picked up three from the Conservatives. Now, we're going to Croydon Central and Chris Rainbow. And here's a cliffhanger, I think, to end your morning transmissions, Alistair. It seems that after two recounts now, the number of votes cast for each of the three candidates now does seem to tally with the total number of votes known to have been registered in the constituency as a whole, or at least it does according to the three-party agents. This always was, of course, the key marginal seat in Croydon. It was held by the Conservatives last February, but with a majority of just 1,314 and needs only a 2.5% swing from the Conservatives to Labour for this seat to change. And now I think we're ready for the results from the returning officer, the Mayor of Croydon, Mr. Paul Rickards. I am going to announce the results of the voting in the Croydon Central constituency and will give the votes cast for the candidates in alphabetical order. The votes cast at this election are as follows. Ian Henry Maxwell, 7,834. Liberal. John Edward Michael Moore, 20,390. David Julian Winnick, 20,226. And John Edward Michael Moore is elected as the member for the Croydon Central constituency. Mr. Moore is an investment banker and a stockbroker, a member of the Bow Group, and he was elected, of course, in February. David Winnick, who came second, chased him up to 164 there, former MP for Croydon South between 1966 and 1970. announced tonight only a 1.1% swing. 
And the story of the night, then, is that from all the swings of fortune and the polls and the results, we believe that uh, Labour is now set for having a clear overall majority, although it is still a slender one. And it may, in fact, uh, be difficult to sustain if the going is as hard as Mr. Wilson said to us and said to Michael Charlton at Highton. For Mr. Wilson, then, there are the pleasures and the pains of remaking his government and setting course for the two and a half years of hard slog, a hell of a time, all these phrases which are used, but which we now perhaps all know are for real. For Mr. Heath, he is no doubt going to remain at the disposal of his party. And uh, for Mr. Heath, the question is, as Mr. Carr was saying a short while ago, perhaps, whether or not his forecasts are proved right or wrong. Now, David, your view so far. Well, for the sixth time in nine elections, we've got a close result. It is odd the way the British electoral system, which can so easily produce landslides, keeps us on the margin. Like in 1910, the last time we had two elections in a year, very few seats have changed hands. Only 23 seats, I think, on the results so far tonight have changed hands, despite all, the, all we've said about the volatility of the electorate. The turnout has gone down fairly uniformly across the country by about 7%. Only in Carmarthen, that super marginal, did it actually go up. The Liberal share of the vote has gone down everywhere. The squeeze hasn't happened. The Nationalists have done well at Conservatives' expense in Scotland, at Labour's expense in Wales. And Bob? Well, I think it's a difficult outcome, really, because the computer is saying there will be a six-seat majority overall for Labour, and it will be based upon 40 to 41 percent of the vote. Now, that is the smallest share of the vote that any majority government has had in 60 years. And uh, it's a very, very precarious and difficult situation if we are moving into the kind of trouble that the, all the party leaders say we are. We'll now give you the final prediction uh, for uh, early this morning anyway. Labour to finish with 321 seats, Conservatives with 276, Liberals with 11 and others, that's Nationalists in Scotland, Wales and the Ulster Unionists we hear from Northern Ireland tomorrow. And for the moment in the second general election of 1974 we say good morning but of course we'll be back with a breakfast programme later. It's been a night of violence in Northern Ireland. A 30-year-old Roman Catholic was shot dead at Newton Abbey when three men forced their way into his home. And a bomb was left in the driveway at the home of Mr. Aidan Corrigan, chairman of the County Tyrone branch of the provisional Sinn Féin. It blew up as experts were dealing with it, but no one was hurt. In the United States, Mrs. Betty Ford, the president's wife, leaves hospital today. Doctors say she's made excellent progress after her operation for breast cancer two weeks ago. Dr. Kissinger, at the end of his visit to President Sadat in Cairo, has said he's encouraged by the talks. They'd given him more hope on the prospects for a lasting peace in the Middle East. Today, he flies on to the Syrian capital on the next stage of his tour of seven countries. In Washington, a jury will be picked later today for the trial of five aides to former President Nixon. The accused include former White House chiefs Bob Haldeman and John Ehrlichman and the former Attorney General John Mitchell. Twelve jurors will be selected from a panel of 45 people. The trial itself is expected to begin on Monday and could go on for at least three months. And during that time, the jurors will have to stay at a hotel near the court. Well, now the weather and Michael Fish. Good morning. Well, the first thing to point out to you, especially if you're driving to work, is that you might run into one or two fog patches in the fourth inclined valleys there. But that clearing away fairly soon. Then for all parts of the country, a day rather like yesterday. Sunny spells coming along but also showers from time to time. Not many showers in the north and west, and the ones that are there are probably coming in mostly on the coast there, but a fair number of showers in the eastern half of the country, and the odd one again rather heavy. Temperatures also like yesterday's near normal in the north and west, but on the rather chilly side in the southeastern corner again. And then to move on to this evening and tonight, a fairly important point I think here, because with clear skies and very little wind around, I think we might have quite a bit of fog around, quite a chilly night with frost in places. That's all for now. Thank you, Michael. And at uh, 7.32, the time now is, let's step back an hour or two, back to uh, earlier in this morning when Mr Wilson, Prime Minister, was in ebullient mood with his wife at the Labour Club in Highton. This is what he said then. 
I'm not going to comment on the national result, except I'll just say this. In my concluding election speeches and my final uh, election broadcast, I said, don't let them talk you out of it. And you haven't. They tried. My God, they tried. And I think there are results, there are still recounts going on in certain constituencies. We just managed to avoid it here. <laughs> but the final result is still in doubt, it is still problematical. But I think, and I, I won't uh, myself uh, venture a prediction, I will base myself on the swingometer of the BBC. which has been moving somewhat erratically tonight, and that was not the fault of the BBC. And uh, the similar contraption in the possession of ITN, I base myself on them, that whatever happens in the remaining votes, and there are still some difficult results to come from Scotland, possibly, where the Conservatives have lost a seat to the Scotnats, uh, Whatever may happen, the Tories can't take it away from us now. Well, I like that tribute, if it was a tribute, to our contraptions. I hope uh, Bob McKenzie's got up again and was able to hear that. Now let's have a quick look at what the papers say, because Fleet Street uh, uh, reflects the early results with its customary variety. There was the Daily Mirror, for example, buoyant, confident of the final result. But the sun, on the other hand, is a shade grudging in its headline. The mail concentrates on the liberal losses rather than the Labour victories. The Telegraph, oh dear, is already looking ahead to the next election. So is Cummings in the Daily Express. Quote, Now, nurse, if you don't wheel me out of this unpleasant situation in double-quick time, I'll sack you at the next election. The Thunderer, The Times, on its front page, wonders whether the Tories, in the light of a Labour victory, might perhaps consider the question of the party leadership, which seems a polite way of saying that Mr Heath may have to go. The Guardian marked the end of the Dick Tavern era with some poignant prose from Philip Jordan. Tavern, like Cinderella, Dick Tavern's hour of reckoning came at midnight. In spite of holding a good share of the vote at Lincoln, he was just nudged out by Miss Margaret Jackson, the official Labour candidate, who swept from the platform, gathering her skirts about her with a wave and an undisguised smile of triumph. The jokes are election jokes, like this one here in the mail. I've lost my seat. And the mirrors. Mum, I think there's been a misunderstanding. When I said Rodney's made it, I was referring to his seat in Parliament. But in the middle pages of all the papers, life goes on despite the election, and yet the life they describe explains the election. Surely there are rising prices and rising crime and rising tempers. But for young, one young citizen, it was all a yawn. That's what the papers were saying. Now let's move over to Brian Woodlake again. Well, now that the election is... Uh almost over. The people who have to pick up the pieces are, of course, the much-discussed unions and managements, and to that purpose we've got uh, Hugh Scandal in the studio tonight, who, of course, is this morning, rather, who, of course, is president of the Engineers Union, and Sir Fred Catherwood, uh, chairman of the British Institute of Management. Fred Catherwood, how do you react to these results? Well, we don't quite know what the final result is, but I would hope that, the, that we would have a government that had a two-year life, because I don't think that we can possibly stand another six months of electioneering. I think that's the first thing. Perhaps, as it's going to be Labour ahead, it's a good idea that they had an overall majority, because they don't much like coalitions. But I think that they've got to behave in a fairly moderate way, because they've got to get a lot of people along with them, and they've got to do a lot of difficult things. Uh, for instance, first of all, I think that there may be quite a lot of companies that are going to run out of cash unless something is done fairly now, soon. Now, how bad is that situation? 
Well, nobody knows, you see, because the one thing you don't tell anyone if you think you're going to run out of cash is that this is about to happen because all the credit has come down. So really nobody does know, but I think there's quite a serious danger that a lot of companies are under a squeeze, that they can't put their prices up, their wages have gone up, their market is dropping off, and I would think that some not very well managed companies will be very short, and they employ people and they export, and I think something may well have to be done for them. Some easing of the price code would be the first thing, allowing uh, them to, uh, to not to have to pay their tax quite so fast would be another thing. I think the other thing is that uh, we have got this social compact. Now we've got to see whether it works or not. And um, I think there are a lot of people, including most managers, uh, who feel rather left out of the social compact. I mean, industry has got to be brought into the thing, otherwise you get the nonsense that we had at Ford's. And the whole professional group, about a million people, not represented through the TUC, not feeling themselves represented through the CBI, have got to be brought into it. And I don't think it'll work unless they are. Certainly, they will be pretty disaffected unless they are. Hughes Candlin, uh, just come to you on your reaction, first of all, to, uh, to what's been happening in the election. Well, obviously, satisfaction, if not delight. Uh, I go with Fred on the... Uh, feeling of abhorrence almost that we might be faced with another election within a short period of time. I would hope it would be much more than two years. I don't think that uh, it will be possible uh, with a majority such as is forecast to achieve uh, what has to be achieved on the Labour Party's programme within that period of two years. Uh, but I disagree with him entirely if I understand the word moderation. It's a much abused word these days. Uh, I think the election's been fought on quite clear lines. Uh, there can be no doubt that the Liberals particularly and the Tories to some extent were for confrontation in one form or other with the trade unions. And I'm delighted that the electorate uh, are, are not going along with that philosophy. The second point that uh, I would emphasize is that I'm not too sure again on Fred's assessment uh, of the general position. Of course, pre-election, uh, everybody is a bit jittery, whether it be the stock exchange or people in management or, 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 or ordinary housewives uh, and people. Uh, they don't feel satisfied, they don't feel secure until they know what is in fact facing them. Uh, but I think the real issues will be the bread and butter issues, the issues of prices, the issues of living standards, uh, the question of the common market and the referendum, these are issues which I think the Labour Party has been to the electorate on and I hope it will stand by them. Yeah, but how much does it... Well, I'd like to bring you in here. Well, um, I was going Howard. to say that I think one of the industrial issues is certainly the common market because at the moment we don't know whether we have the security of this enormous market which most industrialists feel we need. And how can we possibly make any plans for the future if we don't know whether we're going to be in this colossal European market or out of it? I mean, what sort of investment plans could you make now when you've got this referendum hanging over your head? So I think we'd better clear up this negotiation fairly soon, and I would think that if uh, the general feeling was that the terms weren't good enough, then somebody better tell us where we're going to get the tariff-free markets, and if we can't get those tariff-free markets, how we're going to get the industrial expansion that we desperately need. Because the objection that I have to the referendum is that no one is putting a coherent alternative to the common market. We simply can't go back to where we were before because that depended on Commonwealth markets, and in any case, we didn't have the growth. And unless we want to be a perpetually backward nation, we have got to have a market in which we can sell our goods and keep our people in employment. On the other hand, of course, the industry does have an immediate short-term problem, such as the problem that you were mentioning of shortage of cash and the desire, of course, to put out prices to help them out with that kind of thing. Now, Hugh Scanlon, how would you go along with that? Uh, well, again, I, I would think that the shortage of cash, uh, undoubtedly in certain firms, it, it, it is true, uh, but, but I would think most of it is artificial in the sense that uh, we've already talked about, that companies would not go for investment programs until they had some degree of uh, assessment as to the type of government that's going to be in office. I, I, I think that, that now the election's over, that we'll find that the uh, alleged shortage, uh, I would rather put it, unwillingness to invest, uh, 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 will disappear. No, it's not may, may I just make this point? You see, Fred, we have to get down to this fundamental. 
I have never expressed the view, nor has my union, that Britain's economic ills stem, stem from the wages front. We've said it before and I'll repeat it. We have the lowest labour costs in Europe. We have the yeah. highest unit costs in Europe. Yeah. And that comes down to one thing and one thing only, lack of modern equipment in British industry. Yes, That's the that. root of our yes. economic fault. Well, I entirely agree with that <laughs> and that is why I want an incentive for companies to invest in the big market of Europe because if we don't have that big market there's no incentive to invest but there really is a terrible short-term problem in not very well run companies and some companies are not very well run and there are companies now who can see 12 months ahead or 15 months ahead they are simply going to run out of money and unless those people are going to be thrown on the labor market then something has got to be done because your people are operating in companies whether they're efficient or inefficient and it's better I think that they should be allowed to ease prices up a little bit and stay in employment than that prices should be held rigid and thousands of people thrown out of work. Well I I'm not sure again that uh, easing of prices would or would not ensure that, uh, that people remain or are thrown out of work. We, even on prices you come back to what we were talking about uh, the way to get uh, uh, prices down is more efficient ways of manufacture rather right. than artificial barrier of saying, uh, give us a greater price margin. Yes, but we have a short-term problem. I mean, you and I both agree, and we always have agreed, that we need a massive dose of new investment and then we can get real wages up. But we've got to get the investment, and to get the investment we need money and we need markets and we need some plan for a period ahead. And we've got to get through the next year when we are having inflation at the rate I suppose of about 15 percent now and we're dependent on borrowing enough from the Arabs to employ three million people and if we can't borrow that money from the Arabs then we are not going to be able to employ three million people so we have an immediate crisis. Hughes can you, we have you, a last quick word for yeah, you? You can't have your cake and eat it you know. That's what I'm uh, saying. That's what uh, I'm saying. I know That's you are point. but I'm putting it in an entirely <laughs> different way. Uh, we get into deep philosophy but if there is justification of a free enterprise system it is risk capital and in a situation like this there's got to be risk capital there's got to be investment. I'm glad you agree about risk capital. I, don't I, agree. I absolutely uh, agree with him well, about risk now capital. We're not got to be we're, we're not. <laughs> I, I said the justification of a free enterprise God, system I'm, I'm, is, yeah, is free. Oh, I understand it. I entirely disagree with it, but I understand it. Good, good. And so, uh, yes, we've there's got to operate. Got to be, That's the system uh, we've we're, got We're in the world that we are, are right. not the one we'd like or right. one I'd right. like. So we've got so, to operate it for the next So years. give a bit of risk capital instead of saying there must be no risk before we invest. That's what I'm saying to you. Well, I think well, well gentlemen, <coughs> I won't ask you who's going to risk the capital. I just thank you for coming along. Thank you. Bye. Well, let's uh, pursue that line by talking to a man whose face you may well not have seen before, a young man, young 27-year-old Mr. Tom Arnold. Uh, you are indeed unique also in that you are the one and only conservative gain so far recorded in this election. So it's a, a great morning for you. I suppose you're the happiest Tory in the land at the moment. But uh, if you're able to uh, listen to that discussion about inflation, was that in your constituency the main issue or did you choose to fight on others? Well, I think undoubtedly that inflation was the main issue, but I think that it has to be seen uh, against the background of the way politics have developed in Hazelgrove over the last 12 months. Uh, and I think here the fundamental point was the refusal of Jeremy Thorpe and the Liberal members of Parliament to accept Ted Heath's offer of a coalition government last spring. So that became for you uh, the big fighting point, did it? I, I think so, yes, I really do. I mean, I, I think that you can't, you know, argue for proportional representation and then deny the logic of your own argument, which is apparently what the Liberals did, uh, in refusing to accept the principle of coalition. Now you're entering Parliament for the first time, entering a Parliament inside a party which has now been defeated twice in the same year. What are your feelings about that? Well, I'm feeling rather lonely this morning in some respects. I admit to that quite freely. Um, but as to the future course of Conservative policy, um, you know, I think really you've got to give me the chance to get to Westminster and, you know, give me the chance to uh, get to know uh, the House of Commons and also uh, Whitehall and uh, 
local authority departments here so that I can establish, you know, where the true interest of my constituents is going to lie and what is going to be a very difficult period ahead. You may be involved, of course, in some discussions, uh, to use a euphemism, about the future of Mr Edward Heath as leader of the Tory party. Where do you stand there? Well, uh, Ted Heath came to Hazel Grove, and I can only say at the moment that I think that he gave my campaign, locally at any rate, a tremendous lift, uh, as indeed did Mr Whitelaw and Sir Keith Joseph and Lord Carrington and John Davis and uh, Patrick Jenkin and all the other people who came to support me. And uh, again, I can only say that uh, I think in terms of the future direction of uh, the Conservative leadership that there will be a lot of talk and there will be a lot of thinking to be done, uh, but at this stage, certainly, it's premature um, you know, to pinpoint where the conclusions are going to lie. You wouldn't say, would you, that after that talking and that thinking that you were talking about, um, Mr Heath might not conceivably be your man? Well, you see, I've only been a Member of Parliament for seven hours, and I haven't actually yet actually been to the House of Commons, mm. so I really think you've got to give me a chance to, you know, learn something more about the job. All right, well, thank you for talking to us. I'm sure you're going to appear on television a lot more from now on. <laughs> thank uh, you. I, I'm going to move away from you, if I may, because we're talking to some students in Nottingham a bit early, and we didn't give them much chance to talk, so let them do so now with Philip Tibbenham. It now looks like a certain majority of not more less than three and not more than 11 for the Labour government. Could I ask you what your immediate reaction to that is? Well, quite thankful in a way, I must admit. Um, in a way, I, I, I hope they'll be able to get a larger majority than you think. We must have a good working government this time. I don't think the country can stand another two, maybe three years of indecision. What do the rest of you think? Is that enough to assert the firm government? No. I, I think that um, the majority of the uh, considering the number of other people, for sort of liberal Scottish nationalists, etc., in the House of Parliament, that um, the majority of five is sufficient. Are most of you uh, left-wing students? Because most people seem to think that students are always left-wing. No, 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 I don't think <laughs> I don't think at this university you could really call it a left-wing university. It's generally supposed to be rather conservative. Mm, we have got a reputation of being conservative. Yes. So you yes. must be pretty disappointed in the result, then, yeah. by and large? No, well, yeah, well, yeah. I'd like to think we represent young people generally at university. I think this university is a sort of fairly typical example of young people, you know. Mm. Sort of. We're a cross-section, like another <coughs> group of young people in that way. But by and large, what's the talk been in the university? I mean, what have you been looking forward to? Well, I think everybody has expected that Labour would win, but would, nobody knew by what majority. They're just hoping for a large majority to get a proper government in. So, uh, any talk of coalition or any more elections within the next few months. So, how do you see, say, the next year or 18 months with a small Labour majority? Complete indecision. It's going to be hopeless, you know, totally. But at, at least we won't, I hope, be sort of working up to an election all the time like we have been for the last seven months because really this election's been going on since February. There's got to be a bit more stability. Can't be any other way. We've got to have a lot more stability. I mean, as young people, we've got to look at our own futures and we've got to be able to see something in the future. You know, something that we're going to be able to create for ourselves, a different kind of uh, nation. The only way out is, is um, a Labour government committed to socialist policies. It's the only way out, you know. But as young people, how do you feel about the jobs that you'll be going to? It's difficult enough now, isn't it, for graduates to get work? Well, I think this is going to become increasingly diff difficult. Inflation going at such a rate as it is. That, uh, and the jobs, nobody knows what's going to happen to the country. This seems to be on the brink of economic collapse and maybe social collapse. Well, there's got to be a drop in the standard of living somewhere. Mm. We can't go on expanding. Mm. Well, they're saying and it's, it's just to the 1972 <coughs> level already. Yeah, so it dropped by about 4% already. Yeah, but, but that's, uh, that's not much, is it? It's not enough. Definitely not enough. Mm. So what do you think is going to happen to you when you leave here, given the present situation? Unemployment. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously? Yeah. No, I disagree. Yeah. I don't think it's no. necessarily true. I think we've got chances to create something for, our, you know, for ourselves and for the people around us. I think it's a very negative attitude to say that you know, we directly face unemployment. OK, fine. Thank you very much indeed. No, well, there we have the student viewpoint, as it's expressed to Philip Tibbenham in Nottingham University. Just before we move on, I want to show you a pretty picture. Do you recognise that, I wonder, on your screens? That's 
our early morning picture of Jeremy Thorpe's cottage, and we hope to sort of break in there and talk to him a little later in the morning. In the meantime, let me say that we spent a great deal of time last night predicting what the result of this election would be. We have our uh, very sophisticated computer, of course. We have our great brains like David Butler here. But some people predict the result by very different methods. Katina of the London Evening Standard is an astrologer. And uh, we asked her yesterday if she would predict the result. And this is what she said yesterday. Katina, it's now three o'clock on Thursday, the 10th of October, polling day. And we know quite well what the polls have been saying about Labour's lead over the Conservatives, something between 9 and 10 percent. Now, what are things going to look like uh, at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning? What does your crystal well, ball tell you? Uh, it's not a crystal ball. It's, I, I'm, I'm studying the patterns I'm of the planets quite hard. But uh, astrologically, there are no indications to support the opinion polls. In other words, there's no indication of a very heavy swing in any direction. Uh, judging, again, from my charts, I would have expected either a coalition or, more probably, that Labour would just get back again. Maybe with a very slight... But, Everything astrologically points now and in the next three or four years to an increasing trend towards the middle path politically. This is why it's so interesting what is happening with the Labour Party, uh, with the Liberal Party, because that party has a very definite future. So you're saying really that Labour is going to get back tomorrow? Yes, but without the, I'm afraid, I doubt very much whether Mr. Wilson will get the uh, very big swing that he hopes for. Neither will Mr. Heath or Mr. Thorpe. There's no tremendous change. The pendulum is oscillating now, you know, and it doesn't fall in one point or the other as it were, for any length of time. Now, you work out what's going to happen tomorrow on mm. the leaders of the parties, Partly individual the stars, leaders, yes. partly, and partly the horoscopes of uh, what we call the, the charts which are calculated for the times of the new moon, the changes of the seasons, the solstice and the equinoctial Well, charts. What, what are Harold Wilson's stars say? Mr. Wilson, in his own horoscope, is facing a crisis in his career because at the present time, Uranus, which is one of the planets, is very powerful in his horoscope. It's the planet that symbolizes disruption, ruptures of relationships, partnerships or group relationships. So it seems that his main problems will be in maintaining unity within his own party and preventing himself, as it were, being uh, too much controlled by the extreme left wing of the party, because Uranus has to do with what is left. A again, it will involve him in, in, in continual um, friction with the, the, the trade unions. Again, are you ready? You know, you sound more like a political correspondent than somebody who deals with these Well, things. astrology, uh, people mis misinterpret astrology. All that astrology does is consider things logically and study them by the planets, the stars, associating certain planets with certain All right, but what about, what about Ted Heath now? Ted Heath, this is a sun cancer man, a water type. Very strong-willed man because he has eyes very powerful in his horoscope. Uh, cautious, intelligent, but with one handicap in flexibility. And this is why I was looking at his horoscope to see whether he could bring about, assuming he did come back, whether he would be able to achieve what he hopes to do, uh, coalition with the other parties. And go. It seems that his own attitude might be too inflexible to achieve what he is aiming for. You see that? What about Jeremy Thorpe? Jeremy Thorpe, he has the sun in Taurus, the moon in Capricorn, uh, a patient plodder, uh, with a strong Venus in the horoscope, which means he's got um, uh, an exhibitionist streak. That's why he gets his <laughs> showbiz quality. That's, quality, that's why he likes the ladies so mm. much. Mm. Uh, his party, he, Mr. Thorpe himself, he is coming to a, a, a sort of zenith of his career in 1975 and 76. But the party itself is going to be increasingly powerful, and it looks as if there will be a liberal government, if not before 1980, at least in the very early 1980s. But Mr. Thorpe, as leader, seems as though he will have to face very strong competition from some a newcomer as a would-be leader after 1976. Very briefly, Katina, what about the economic situation for the next three years? Because that's the thing that worries everybody. Well, uh, it is not as black as people fear. There is a steady, it's very moderate, but it is a steady uh, partial recovery of the economy starting in January. It is at its best during the spring and summer of next year. It recedes again, alas, 
after that. Our worst period, our worst recession, and this is because we are going to be, we're going to be involved in a world trade recession, comes from 1976 to 1980. Then we have a very good cycle. Katina, thank you very much. We'll be watching your predictions like a hawk tomorrow morning. Thank, thank you. you. And indeed, Katina, who's uh, over there with Brian Whitlake at the moment, will be talking to you a bit later in the morning. Actually, you were saying that Jeremy Thorpe, if I got it right, has the sun in Taurus. I'm not really sure what that means, but I do know that the sun is rising over his cottage right now, and we're going over there to hear from David Lomax. Yes, Michael, I don't know what the sun in Taurus means either. But uh, good morning to you from Thorpe Country. This is the constituency of North Devon. As, as you can see, the sun is gently breaking now over this constituency. 600 square miles of rolling North Devon countryside, which stretches all the way down from Hartland Point across Exmoor. I think you might just be able to see Exmoor in the distance there, over to Linton. And this morning, it still is Thorpe Country, although not quite so definitely as it was in February. Because early this morning, Mr. Thorpe's majority was cut from 11,000 to 7, 7,000. After he'd been chaired through the middle of Barnstaple, he returned here to his cottage. It's just out of sight, just down the lane there. The cottage of Higher Chuggerton, near Cobberton, where, of course, he isn't a very happy man this morning. His aides and party workers are looking pretty glum earlier on because of the way the Liberal vote has slumped in almost every constituency that's so far been declared. This morning when I talked to Mr Thorpe, he was very reluctant to be drawn into discussing the implications of what seems like uh, a Liberal collapse, but we hope to be talking to him later on this morning at about 11 o'clock. This is David Lomax in Devon North. Well, David, don't go away if you can still hear me, can you? Yes, I can. Uh, obviously, this has been a very, very disappointing uh, election for Jeremy Thorpe, but you've been with him for the last three weeks, almost daily and constantly throughout those days. Um, what, how high were his hopes really, deep down, do you know? Very difficult to tell. He was putting a very brave front on it the whole time. I think at certain times during the campaign, I watched him at a, at a meeting in Altrincham. He was generally extremely buoyant. He did seem to be convinced that it only needed just one more heave and then they would break the party system as he kept telling his supporters. And he was genuinely elated, it seemed, the whole time. And his party workers were just amazed at the sort of energy that he had that kept him going after meeting after meeting. So I think he must be very, very seriously shocked by the way the result has gone so far. Yeah. Well, David Lomax, thank you very much indeed. No doubt we'll be hearing from you and Mr Thorpe later in the day. It's exactly 8 o'clock. Now, let's, David Butter, let's have a quick sort of recap. There behind me are the uh, figures up to now with those 493 results in. 294 to Labour, 185 to Conservatives, five Liberals and nine others. And as I keep saying, but I think we ought to keep saying, uh, it, it is important to make the point that Labour must have that kind of number at this time. Well, of there day. are only 142 results to come, but only 25 of those are Labour-held seats. So if Labour just wins the seats that it now holds and doesn't gain any more, it will end with 319 seats, 318 is a clear majority. We're in a very close run thing because, there's, by my reckoning, there are only about six seats to come where Labour has serious chance of winning, and most of those, the chances are a good deal less than even. So I think we probably end up with the Labour, Labour Party getting somewhere, probably more than 319 seats, but not more than 323 or something like that as the outside thing. So one's between a sort of majority of three and a majority of 11 as the likely final outcome of the Labour Party over all parties. Now, mind you, there are one or two friends of Labour in the Welsh Nationalists, possibly Jerry Fitt from Northern Ireland. We haven't heard any Ulster results yet. So it's not, a, it's a little better for Labour than just those figures might suggest. Nonetheless, it's probably not going to be a two-figure majority. One of the figures that Labour supporters would most like to see again, even if they've already seen it six times, is, this, is, is the number of Labour gains so far. There are 18 of them. Talk us through those. Well, there is Lincoln, and that, I think, will give them enormous satisfaction because that's Dick Tavern's career as an independent uh, brought to an end. Nelson and Co. in the Lancashire Marginal after a recount, Rossendale after a recount. Oxford, uh, my own constituency, I think there wasn't a recount there. It was quite a comfortable win for Evan Lord on his fourth round, I think, with, uh, against Monty Woodhouse. Uh, Rochester and Chatham, quite a big swing there, uh, and a Labour gain. Uh, Southampton test. Ipswich, the most marginal seat two elections back, swung quite clearly to the Labour column. 
Bolton West, one of the, another of the Northwest Marginals, where four seats were gained by the Labour Party. Ilford North, the one one in the GLC area, the one seat to change hands in the GLC area. Peter Burr, that super marginal, quite comfortably in the Labour column. Michael Ward wins at the fourth attempt. Bristol Northwest, uh, that went over uh, as the one seat in the West Country to change hands uh, so far. Uh, Birmingham Selly Oak, that's the biggest swing in a seat changing hands. There was a very big swing in Birmingham. Leicester South, that's Tom Boardman, a former cabinet minister, out. Leicester entirely Labour held for the first time since 1950. Uh, Wellington Hatfield, Helen Middleweek, uh, a 25 year old, wins the uh, ele an election on her honeymoon. Berry and Radcliffe, Mr. Fiddler defeated in a seat uh, uh, that has been Conservative since 1970. Hemel Hempstead, it was a very marginal seat, goes quite firmly into the Labour column. Berwick and East Lothian, the Conservatives only gain at the last election. John McIntosh wins it back from the Earl of Ancrum. Litchfield and Tamworth, Major Goldsmith is defeated there. And here is the Conservatives only gain. Hazel Grove, where Michael Wynne Stanley uh, has got, been defeated for the second time in Hazel Grove, which he only won back last February. And here are the SNP gains, four gains, all at the expense of the Conservatives. The Conservatives may feel themselves unlucky because they only lost Galloway by 30 votes and uh, Barton East in a very tight three-way race. They only lost it by 22 votes. There was, of course, one Plaid Cymru gain, but let's, while we were looking at that SNP list of gains, move straight to Glasgow and Kenneth Roy. Well, it's been a night of steady, if not spectacular, success for the Scottish National Party. They've taken four seats from the Conservatives at Galloway, Perth and East Perthshire, South Angus and East Dumbartonshire, where schoolteacher Mrs Margaret Bain squeezed home by a mere 22 votes. And at the age of 28, Mrs Bain will be one of the youngest and certainly one of the most decorative recruits to the new Parliament. The SNP ran Labour very close second in many of the industrial constituencies of the central belt, but significantly didn't make uh, gains from Labour, which the pundits and certainly most of the polls were predicting. The SNP consolidated their hold on Dundee East, which they took from Labour in February, and also retained the northern constituency of Bampshire. But perhaps the most striking feature of the election here in Scotland has been the eclipse of the Conservatives, who have been replaced by the SNP as the main opposition to Labour in seat after seat. And with 15 Scottish results still to be declared, including five seats held by the SNP, the Nationalists may be about to cut even deeper into that Tory vote. Another gain I did mention, the one gain for Plaid Cymru in Wales, where Gwynver Evans uh, came back at Carmarthen, which naturally takes us over to Cardiff and John Darren. Well, the president of Plaid Cymru, of course, recaptured the seat that he lost to Labour in 1970 and inflicted the only Labour defeat so far in this election. Plaid Cymru also retained the two seats that they captured from Labour in the February election at Carnarvon and Merioneth with increased majorities. But elsewhere, the party lost their deposits in 15 constituencies. Despite the setback at Carmarthen, Labour consolidated their grip on many of the Welsh constituencies, especially in the industrial southeast of Wales. And despite a significant swing against the Conservatives, they held on to all their seats in Wales, but their majority in seats such as Pembroke and Conway was in fact halved. They also lost ground in Cardiff. The Liberal vote fell back generally, but they did hold Cardigan, the seat they won from Labour in February, and they also beat the Conservatives into second place at Wrexham, Llanetley, and also at Ebu Vale. With 29 results in and seven now to be declared later on today, the state of the parties in Wales is this. Labour, 20, Conservatives, 5, Plaid Cymru, 3, and Liberals, 1. Thank you, John. And now we're seeing stars again. We're going over to Brian Whitlake and Katina. Katina, that really was an uncanny prediction which you made uh, yesterday. Mm. Well, one is indeed why one bothers about polls or computers or anything like that. Did you have a bet on it? No. I didn't even look in. I haven't looked in at television. I didn't know what was happening until I got here this morning. Have I you, never do. Have you ever, have, in fact, have you ever predicted an election before? Yes, I've predicted most of the American elections. I go over there especially to do so. Now, we were talking uh, in that particular interview many hours ago now uh, about the economic situation as you saw it. Tell me, what do you think is going to happen politically over the next six months? Do you, do you think there's going to be a tremendous rumpus? 
The, the main problem, as far as our foreign political relations are concerned, or rather they are economic, is the problems we will have with the EC, because the EC itself, the countries involved in Europe, are going to be perpetually at each other's throats throughout the coming year, not merely the next six months. Uh, other than that, curiously enough, it, it looks as though uh, politically we gain more respect, as it were, abroad, because you'll find that, oddly enough, sterling strengthens instead of weakening. This is always an indication, you know, of the political <laughs> atmosphere. Well, can you tell me why? The ster ster why sterling I doesn't think... have a star, does it? No. No, well, it's part of the uh, calculations I make for the stock exchange trains, um, which have their own economic background. The thing is, is I think that uh, we are going, uh, whichever party had come in, we are going to have a very, very tough program. In other words, we're going to show our teeth at last and, and show we're getting down to things. You know, there's a different mood in the country, and this is one that's irrespective of party. So this wins respectable because I have, uh, uh, as you probably know, my, most of my work is with business companies and business people, and what really has worried people abroad is our own, as it were, instability. Now they will see a change in us. This wins us greater faith abroad, as it were. So therefore, in a political sense, we benefit rather than lose from what develops in the coming months. Well, I do hope that your business clients perk up as a result of all this. Thank well, you very much. Well, they haven't got Thank much to hope for on the stock exchange yet. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming along. Mike. Thank you. Well, now we're still dashing around the country saying good morning to all and sundry. This time we're going to go over to Cheltenham to an engineering factory there and Julian Mounter. Well, good morning and welcome to Cheltenham. Here at the Doughty Fuel Systems Factory, where they've just changed shift, I'm going to have a word with some of the men who make the very complicated machinery that fuels the aircraft industry. Uh, sort of carburettors, I'd call it. Sid, you've been here for 25 years. How do you feel about the um, results as they're coming in now? Uh, well, if we, uh, if we can improve on them slightly, I should be a lot happier, obviously. Uh, the last sort of thing that I... I heard was that uh, it would probably be somewhere in about 12 or even as less as 3, which uh, I think is a little bit uh, too uh, not enough, you know. Uh, I think that uh, the only thing is that if it is a, a lesser majority, then obviously it will keep the MPs in Westminster instead of on a holiday or something like that. You know. Right, well, uh, it doesn't look as if uh, Harold Wilson's going to get a very large majority, but he might have enough to go ahead and uh, nationalise the aircraft industry. How would you feel if this factory, for instance, well, was taken over by the government? Yeah, well, I certainly would uh, appreciate that. Um, in my opinion, it, it wants doing a lot more. Uh, we're all on government orders, and after all, uh, we're the workers. Uh, the shareholders are certainly were helped with the beginning, all right, fair enough. Uh, we, want our, we want our fair share, we produce it, and nationalisation, I think, proper nationalisation would help tremendously, I think. But Sid, this uh, factory makes a profit. It's been quite prosperous since it's been in existence, about yes. 22 years ago. Well, obviously, uh, it was started during the war. The war helped to get it on its feet. Uh, the men has carried on from there. But do you really think there's a need to nationalise it? Oh, I think so. Not only in the aircraft industry. Uh, in my opinion, the land, uh, the land be doesn't, the land obviously doesn't belong to anyone. Fine. Well, thank you very much, Sid. I'm going to move along here now and come down to Bob. Hello, Bob. Hello. What do you think about the results as they're coming in at the moment? Well, personally, I thought it was a foregone conclusion. Um, it was certainly my prediction. How did you vote, Bob? I voted Tory. So how do you feel about the possibility that this factory, if uh, Labour goes ahead with its nationalisation plans, uh, could end up uh, being nationalised and you end up working for the government? Well, I'm certainly not very pleased about it. Um, I feel there are large enough firms in the country which can do quite well enough without nationalisation. Um, it's certainly not for me and not for this company, I don't think. It's um, also given me a very good living, as you can see for yourself. What do you fear about the possibility of the nationalised? What don't you like about the uh, company, the, the people who have already nationalised, the uh, railways, uh, uh, electricity board, gas board, that sort of thing? Well, I think you said it for yourself there, really. Um, from what I can gather from them, they're just not successful. Um, most of them lose money, and 
are just not very happy, sort of um, employees-wise. Disputes are more happy. Fine. Well, thank you very much, Bob. And that's the early reactions here at the Doughty Fuel Systems factory in Cheltenham. Cheltenham, which uh, always has taken part in those horse races that come just after 11 o'clock on election night. It didn't win this time. It came second. Guildford was first, and I made it just exactly 10 minutes past 11. However, after going to Cheltenham there, let's have a look at what's happening in our own regions. At ha and there it's just 12 and a half minutes past eight. So how are you getting on in your area? Well, I'm getting on very well. We just haven't got any more results in, Michael. But let's take a look, first of all, at the state of the parties in London and the South East. Labour have 51 seats in the GLC area, including just one gain. That, of course, was Ilford North. And Conservatives have 35 seats. In the home counties, Labour have 13 seats, including those four gains, Oxford, Wellin and Hatfield, Hemel Hempstead, and Rochester and Chatham. Conservatives have 34 seats. That leaves 27 seats still to come, 21 of those, of course, in the rural home counties. Well, now, let's move on and spare a thought for the noble few who've been doing their bit for the nation's economy with charitable contributions to the Treasury. Lost deposits in London and the South East alone have probably made the new Chancellor of the Exchequer a cool £14,000 already. And in times of financial crisis, it seems going to the country could make better economic sense than going even to the Arabs. Principal contributors in the South East, of course, could be the National Front, with 47 losable deposits. And Mr Tom Keane of the campaign for a more prosperous Britain, whose aptly named organisation should contribute nationally no less than £1,800, 600 of which has already come from London alone. Time was when lost depositors modestly described themselves as just plain independents. Now it seems anybody can be leader of his own party. With similar intentions, Mr John Renton turned himself into the anti-extremist party for Eton and Slough. I'm not a politician, said Mr Renton, just an ordinary chap and the people of Eton and Slough agreed with him and voted for someone else. Ordinary, though. Well, far from ordinary, though, was Malcolm Greatbanks, the first ever candidate to stand for the Gay Liberation Front in Norwood. For those of you who thought the Gay Liberation Front was an organisation for the promotion of homosexual equality and not a political party, the Gay Liberation Front is indeed an organisation for the promotion of homosexual equality. Just why Mr Greatbanks wanted to stand for Parliament isn't quite clear, except that he sees sexism as the foot of all oppression. Only 223 consenting adults in Norwood agreed with him in the privacy of the ballot box. Meanwhile, Chelsea threw up slag, the Save London Action Group, in the guise of Mr Richard Evelyn uh, Byron, I think his name is, and claims to be, and in fact is, a descendant of the poet. Mr Byron, whose result is still tensely awaited, is president of the School for Guides for London. Not girl guides, of course, but the kind who show you round historic buildings. Slag described themselves as London's nationalists, which does seem to be taking devolution to extremes. Meanwhile, in the uh, province of Romford, Len Sampson stood for the People and Agrarian Party, described as the only agricultural party in the country. For the voters of Romford, who've never seen a ploughed acre this side of the A12, it was clearly the only agricultural party in the town as well. Rodney. In Mitcham and Morden, the electorate was watching Mr William Bokes, and he was busy losing his deposit for the sixth time. Mr. Bokes stands for the ARPSWR, which in turn stands for Air, Road, Public Safety, White Resident. Mr. Bokes clearly believes in naming his party after his policies. Fortunately, the big parties don't agree with the idea, or we'd find ourselves voting for a different name every time. And finally, Mr. Louis Byrne of Luton, who had just that problem. Mr. Byrne, a builder, went to the town hall to put his name down as candidate for the Irish Civil Rights Association. In the space where he should have written Irish Civil Rights Association, he put down his occupation by mistake. His occupation, remember, was builder. So Mr. Byrne wrote down property developer. And so he became the first ever property development candidate for Luton East. Mr. Byrne will not be taking up his seat in the House on Monday. And now on to one of the more serious of the unusual candidates in the campaign, who was Dr. Una Kroll, who stood as the women's rights campaign candidate in Sutton and Cheam. It was the first time for many elections that a candidate had fought specifically on the issue of a fair deal for women. During the campaign, we asked her what her election platform was. All the big issues, housing, inflation, uh, education, 
and we're simply saying that people matter more than party politics, that women are people, important members of our community, and that they are going to be the hardest hit by housing shortages, the hardest hit by inflation, and the hardest hit by educational inopportunities which occur here in Sutton. So we're actually applying everything that we say to the big issues from the woman's standpoint. Yeah. But unfortunately, in spite of the help of the actress Glenda Jackson and Maureen Pryor, who appeared in the Suffragette series Shoulder to Shoulder, Dr. Kroll only polled 298 votes. After the declaration, Richard Kershaw spoke to her. Dr. Kroll, you got 298 votes. Is that a great disappointment? Yes, of course it is, because it doesn't reflect the kind of support we've been getting from literally hundreds of people in the country uh, overall. But they didn't vote for you here. No, and I think we have to remember that Sutton and Sheem hadn't even heard of us. There was no nucleus of a group here. There was nothing. Uh, only myself, really. And in four weeks, we have gathered an enormous amount of goodwill and support. Now, a lot of people didn't vote for us because it is a marginal. Uh, it was an important election. Nevertheless, the 298 people who did vote for us are going to form a nucleus and I have no doubt at all that we will keep up the pressure and we will go on using constitutional political methods to gain what we consider to be very important and that is people's oh, Now, are you going to fight again? Are you going to try another seat? Well, we don't know. We have to plan our strategy. That I, you know, but we're... How, how many votes, really, honestly, did you hope to get here? A thousand. A brave face and a brave loser. Dr. Una Kroll, the only women's rights cam candidate standing in the country. And she told me during her campaign, actually, that she knew she wasn't going to do very well. She didn't mind losing. She was very, very willing to have a go. Very brave lady. Brian. Well, Sue, we have yet another MP here. Sir Michael Havers, the Conservative MP for Merton and Wimbledon, who triumphed tonight. Uh, Sir Michael, it appears that the electorate has really, in this, in this election, opted for a two-party system. Does that distress you? No, I, I think that that probably is the better way of running the country. For what reason? Well, traditionally we always seem to have the, um, I think, a much more secure government when we have one party in with the other one pressing hard in opposition rather than the fragmentation that appeared to be likely to happen in February. On the other hand, of course, the Conservatives did offer the country um, the idea of coalition, which suggested that they were prepared to accommodate not just the Labour Party, but indeed the Liberals and perhaps even other people. Yes, well, that's quite different. What we were seeking to say in this election was that the crisis was so severe that the only way we were going to beat it was by having a national policy. If we were going to have a national policy, then it would be very much better if we had in effect, a national government, or a government in which all shades of opinion were represented. Why do you think that your, your own party lost? I think still the public hasn't really grasped the nature of the crisis. They almost grasped the nettle in February, and I think that there's been such a conflict of statistics. I think they're completely confused. On the doorsteps, I had a number of people who just couldn't understand where the truth of it lay. I would have thought, with respect, that indeed they'd been, they knew that there was a crisis, uh, been hammered home to it. The figures became almost irrelevant uh, in one sense because politicians of all colours were in fact saying there was a very grave uh, crisis, the worst we've faced for many years now. Surely they, they got to grips with that one. Well, I didn't find this. I found time after time the people really saying, oh, you politicians are just making great fuss about it. Things aren't nearly as bad as you say. And they were getting this contrast between either 20% inflation or 8.4% inflation. And I think they've been completely confused in a large number of cases. How much faith do you place now uh, in the social contract? Well, of course, everybody hopes that it will work because some kind of agreement, some kind of understanding by ordinary trade unionists that this cannot go on. One cannot have wage increases that cannot be represented by greater production Unless that is accepted across the board, then I can see inflation just getting worse. Therefore, any kind of contract which is going to make that work must be a good thing. I I'm not optimistic about it. Why not? Because I don't think when the cards are down on the table that the number of the union leaders will in fact honour it. That's my guess. 
I hope it's not right, but I fear it is. Do you believe that the Conservative Party, who've not had the best record over the past four years with their dealings with the union, could have, with the unions, could have done much better? Well, I think that if you look back at the enormous amount of time that was taken between <coughs> Mr. Heath and various other members of the Cabinet in discussions with leading trade union officials, those discussions went on over, I think, 18 months. More time was spent doing that than ever before. It really is a tragedy that more didn't come out of it. What is going to happen to the, um, to the <coughs> Conservative Party now? Well, we shall uh, have to look again at our policies, look again at what happened, the inevitable post-mortem that follows any election when a party loses will take place. I don't see the sort of... Uh, depressing outlook that's already being forecast of Mr. Heath going or anything of that kind. I think we fought a good election. We confounded the pollsters again, particularly confounded the straw poll last night, which I think scared a lot of people, We're talking of 180 difference between Labour and Conservatives. In fact, the result has shown a very small swing. It may be, I suspect this has happened in a number of cases, I certainly met it on the doorsteps. It may be the fear that if <coughs> uh, conservatives came back, we'd be faced with confrontation. Public taking the easy way out in a number of cases has influenced people. Sir Michael, thank you very much. Well, I have with me now Ulla Terkelsen of the Danish Broadcasting Company and Sandro Paternostra. Did I do it right? Exactly. <laughs> who's the chief correspondent of Italian television. Tell me first, Ola, how interested were the Danish people in our British election? Oh, they have been very interested, especially, of course, uh, uh, with regards to the common market, because um, we are in the common market because Britain is. The Danish application to join was uh, launched as a result of the British application to join. And, of course, the whole uh, common market issue, uh, Britain's uh, continued members, it might be thrown open. Uh, if there is a, a Labour majority, which it looked like, and if uh, the question is put to a referendum. So therefore, you know, we have really been covering it a lot. Of course, you actually had a referendum before going into the common market, didn't yes, you? Yes, we did, and uh, of course Ireland had a referendum as well, the, the three new member countries. And I think most people in Denmark have always felt it's slightly peculiar that Britain, which were the people who sparked off the two other applications, the Danish and the Irish, did never have one. Do you think, though, that, that they will be welcoming the what looks like being the result, that Labour is going to have a majority? Do you think they'll be welcoming that with um, regard to the common market? Well, um, the uh, pro-marketeers, of course, will be slightly worried because if that brings about a referendum which takes Britain out, that means that the pro-marketeers will then are in a slightly tricky position. The anti-marketeers in Denmark, and the amount of anti-marketeers uh, is growing, will be very pleased with a, a Labour government which has a referendum because then they can start pushing again for a rethink in Denmark on the whole membership issue. Sandra, does the British election have any great, um, does it make any great mark on the Italian public or couldn't they care less about us? Well, in Italy, the elections in England has been followed with uh, very much attention. We are very much interested in the social contract because we have the same problem in Italy, relations between the government and the trade unions, and we think the social contract is something constructive and positive. And uh, after all, I think we should have reasons to be happy in Italy that the majority of Harold Wilson is not such a big majority that he may have the temptation of doing foolish things like uh, taking out England from the common market. After all, the Labour Party has a wing of uh, European-minded uh, gentlemen like uh, Roy Jenkins uh, who would avoid Oh, well, I'm glad to hear you both want us to stay there anyway. What about the image uh, of, of the British abroad now in Italy, Sandro? I mean, uh, we were always sort of thought to be great gentlemen who could rise to the crisis. Do you find that image has been dented at all over the past couple of years? Well, I would put it this way. In Italy, everything is personal and nothing is private. In uh, England, everything is private and nothing is personal. We have appreciated very much the civilized way you have done the electoral campaign and the fact that, after all, Ted Heath, Harold Wilson and Jeremy Thorpe have agreed on the necessity of a recovery for the country. I think there are a lot of good intentions and a lot of goodwill in your country of recovering from a crisis which, after all, is not so dramatic 
as some people may think it is. So you still think we're pretty civilised? Well, that, that's nice. By to all know. means. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Another quick bit of traffic news in Bedfordshire, northbound carriageway of the M1. A lorry was on fire, and the debris is still blocking one traffic lane between Junction 12 and Junction 13. The traffic has built up for about half a mile. Could drivers slow down as they approach this area? Say the police. And of course, that coach is still broken down on the London-bound carriageway of the M2. Two, causing a traffic hazard between Junction 4 and Junction 3 at Bridgewood. Police say they're trying to get the vehicle removed as soon as possible. In the meantime, they want motorists to approach with care. Mike. Well, now let's have a look at the national scene. You may remember during the campaign that uh, Mr Edward Heath, assuming he was going to be Prime Minister, said that he would call the other leaders to meet him on Saturday. And Mr Wilson's repost was, when asked by Robin Day, I think, whether he'd go to such a meeting, said simply, I shall be at Chequers on Saturday. Well, he will be. Uh, Mr Wilson remains Prime Minister. The Labour Party has an overall majority in Parliament. Although it's just how... Will have, did I, will have. Did I not you say? You said has. All right, you will have careful. an overall majority, but uh, we think it's a very, very slender one, about seven, David. Yeah. Right, let's go over now to the news and Kenneth Kendall. Uh, some reaction from abroad to the trend of results so far. In Washington, government officials are reported to have welcomed the majority government that's being predicted without making any comment on the fact that it's a Labour one. Diplomatic observers there believe that an announcement will be made soon by the White House on a meeting between President Ford and Mr. Wilson. In Paris, French officials are reported as saying they hope there will now be a speedy conclusion to Britain's common market negotiations. There's no formal government comment, but officials don't believe a Labour victory will necessarily lead to British withdrawal from the EEC. And reports from West Germany say the prospect of an overall Labour majority has been welcomed in government circles. The Bonn government is also looking for a rapid conclusion to the EEC negotiations and an end to the uncertainty caused by the period of minority government. In Northern Ireland, a night of violence. A 30-year-old Roman Catholic was shot dead at Newton Abbey when three men forced their way into his home. And a bomb was left in the driveway at the home of Mr. Aidan Corrigan, chairman of the County Tyrone branch of the provisional Sinn Féin. It blew up as experts were dealing with it, but no one was hurt. In the United States, Mrs. Betty Ford, the president's wife, leaves hospital today. Doctors say she's made excellent progress after her operation for breast cancer two weeks ago. Dr. Kissinger, at the end of his visit to President Sadat in Cairo, has said he's encouraged by the talks. They'd given him more hope on the prospects for a lasting peace in the Middle East. Today, he flies on to the Syrian capital on the next stage of his tour of seven countries. For now, Michael Fish and the weather. Good morning. Well, it's a little bit of a misty start at the moment in parts of the Forth and Clyde Valleys, also some central areas of England, but very soon now that's going to clear away. And then for most parts of the country, I think we can look forward to quite a bright day, sunny spells from time to time. Uh, the best of the sunshine, I think, in the western half of the country, rather more in the way of cloud in the east. There's going to be showers again, though, uh, cropping up in just about all parts of the country. Most of the showers, though, over in the eastern half there, where the odd one could be fairly heavy. In the west, I think the showers are most likely to come along on the north-facing coast, North Wales, parts of Devon and Cornwall, that sort of area. So not many showers in the west, the brighter picture. And in the west, the highest, the t the highest temperatures near normal. In the east, still a little bit on the chilly side. And on that chilly theme, I think this evening and tonight will be pretty cold in most parts of the country, some frost around, and maybe quite a bit of fog. So that's a point if you're going to be driving around early tomorrow. And that's all. And uh, we're moving around the country yet again now. We're hoping to go to uh, Carmarthen, to Belfast, from whom we haven't heard so far. But first of all, to Newcastle, where Eddie Milne, I hope, is there. Are you, Mr Milne? Can you hear me? Well, I can see you, but I feel we're not getting sound. So what I'll do, uh, Mr Milne, is ask you to stay there while the engineers uh, sort out the sound problem and go straight over to Belfast and Billy Flax. I think, I think we've lost that too. So the, 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 I don't know whose dog that was. Can we have another look at that dog? Well, I wonder where that is. I did say we were going to get around the country but I'm not at all sure where that might be. Certainly uh, not any of the gentlemen I was hoping to talk to. So who can we go to now, I wonder? I'm looking around the country. Yes, let's try Billy Flax. Billy Flax, can you hear me? No, he can't. The prospect ah. of a narrow-majority Labour government caused very mixed feelings among the United Unionists here this morning. 
Their leader, Mr Harry West, who's been fighting hard to hold the always marginal seat of Hermanus and Tyrone, told me he felt it would strengthen the bargaining power of the Unionists if the gap was close between the parties. But he added, it mightn't be good for the United Kingdom as a whole if there wasn't an administration with an effective majority to deal with the serious economic issues. The United Unionists are hoping to hold at least 10 of the 11 seats they won in February. But clearly Mr West's own seat is in real danger. And if he loses to an independent, the question of Mr Eamon, Enoch Powell assuming the leadership of the Westminster Unionists would immediately arise. And there could be divisions among the Unionists on this point. Both the Unionists and the pro-power sharing parties of the former executive have a big stake in the votes being counted here today. For Ulster voters face a further election, that would be the sixth here in about two years, probably in the spring, to elect the new constitutional convention, which has tried to hammer out some sort of agreement on the system of government in Northern Ireland. And any group which suffers a reverse here today will feel its position weakened in the run-up to what all politicians here agree could be the most vital headcount in these years of Ulster crisis. Thank you, Billy Flax. I've just heard that that dog we were looking at was actually in Carmarthen. I don't know whether there's any more intelligent conversation to be had from that spot. And anyway, we do hope to bring a, a rather better picture of the place and some conversation in a moment or two. Mr. Eddie Milne is still, I think, in our Newcastle studio, but still having Well, uh, you've been looking at the dog, have you? And I, I don't ah. think you can see the stickers he's got on. He's a very happy dog this morning because he supports Gwynvor Evans. And that's what the sticker says. And uh, even the dogs in Carmarthen wear election stickers. This is his master who's in the agricultural bu business. But I have been joined this morning by some uh, farmers who farm near Carmarthen. I want to take their opinion on uh, how the election has gone. What do you feel? You've got a prime herd of Welsh blacks. How do you feel about the change of tenure here and the election of Gwynvor Evans? Will it make a lot of difference to you? I hope it will. I think he's the only man that we have trying that will stand up for agriculture and really make himself heard in London. Whereas before, when they're in a big party like that, they haven't really got the chance to speak for the farmers. Well, can you explain in, in what way Gwyn Gwynoro Jones, who held a seat for Labour, and his party have let you down? Why have you rejected him? <coughs> well, we've been let down in the price that we're getting for our uh, products these days. Beef cattle have dropped uh, dramatically down from £20 pound down to about £12 pound a hundredweight. And I'm sure Gwynver Evans can do something to assist the farmers in that way. Can we look back to last night, and if I could uh, talk to some people over here on the pavement, perhaps you could come into view a little. Uh, do you think that it was the farmers, farming vote that was decisive in putting Gwynver Evans in here? Well, You're a member of his party, you should know, I think. That's definite. He was, he was visiting the countryside, you know, well, he's from the country himself, and he comes to the market. It's not now he's coming, he's here all the time. And he knows the, he knows the point, and he, he, when he'll go up to London, there's nobody there to turn him down. Can, if somebody tells him to sit down, he can get up again and speak for himself. There was another issue in the constituency that someone was mentioning to me last night. They were talking about land nationalisation, which may have gone against the Labour Party here. Is there something in that? No, I don't think that, that was the main factor. <laughs> the main factor was the, uh, the position of the farmers in general at the moment. The Your morale in Wales is very, very low, isn't it? This is true. Oh, this is definitely true at the moment, especially amongst the farmers because uh, they, uh, I don't think the farmers remembered uh, such a bad, worse time as this before. All right, well now for the second time in a decade you have a Welsh Nationalist MP. Uh, can you explain what you as a farmer would like to see him do when he arrives at Westminster? And there are two others with him, remember, from Wales now. Well, we would like him to look after the Welsh interest uh, from a national point, to look after the small family farm to do away with this crippling estate duty that's crippling the bona fide farmer that stops his son coming on to farming because this is vital. We've been we're having amalgamations of farms but yet at the death of the owner himself the children have got to repay for that farm once and over again. So this is crushing for the Welsh farmer which is typically Welsh family farms. Are you expecting a lot of them? Are you personally pleased at the change of tenure here? Well indeed, yes I am, because now we have a greater hope that we shall be heard in the corridors of power at London. Thank you very much. That's the verdict uh, on this morning of uh, October the 11th from the farmers of Carmarthen. And I'm going to, from Carnarvon, make one more attempt to uh, get hold of Eddie Milne uh, from the... Are you there, Mr Milne? I'm here, I, yes. I can see and hear you both yes, this time. Yes, I'm here, Michael. Yeah, thank you. We got the news just a few hours ago of your defeat at Blythe. Um, to what do you attribute it? Well, there was a powerful machine mounted against me, Transport House, the Northern Regional Labour Party and the General Secretary and officials of the National Union of Mine Workers 
decided that Eddie Milne had to be removed and uh, they did it narrowly. It was a very close run battle indeed. I was proud of the people around me, but the machine was too much for us. Isn't that, though, Mr. Milne, just slightly insulting to the voters? You're saying they would pay more attention to the, the big guns, to the party machines, to the, uh, the posters, perhaps, and the rosettes, than to what candidates are actually saying and proposing? No, I don't think it's insulting to the voters. I think it's a tribute to them. If you'd been in Blythe with me, Michael, during those three weeks of the hectic campaign, you would have been proud of the people of Blythe that they stood so closely around us because they realized the issues that were involved and don't forget that we almost pulled off the impossible. You didn't though. Was it a clean fight? No, it wasn't a clean fight by any manner of means. When you send a public relations company or com public relations firms in to fight an independent candidate in a democratic election, you can't call it a clean fight when you have smear campaigns on a massive scale such as have been mounted against myself in the last five years when people like ted short describe us as a squalid little fellow from blythe then you realize the type of offensive that was mounted not only against myself but against the many excellent people around me well, Mr. Milne, you won't be able to take them on on the floor of the House of Commons any longer. But no, uh, some, of them, some of them will be glad of that, and that's what they worked for. Well, thank you for talking to me this morning. I must get away because we want to go up to Birmingham now to New Street Station.